Hi, everyone, and welcome to the last day of our Journalist Empowerment Conference. I'm feeling a little bit nostalgic, I have to be honest, but this is only one step more in this community to empower and to connect the freelance community. I am Anna from the European Journalism Center, and today I will be hosting the last day of the event with my colleagues, Estela, Gaura, Rosalind, Sebastian, and Angela. And today is everything about the storytelling, how to engage with your audiences, how to create trust with your audience. And we're ready to go. So Estela, how are you today? Welcome. Hi, Anna. I am very ready and I'm very happy to be here. And um, I'm also ready for the last part of the program. And it's exciting that a lot of people are also here joining us from all over the world. Um, we have people from the Midlands in England, from Emma. We have uh, Stephanie from Barcelona. We have Vinita from Nepal. That's quite a cool mix. Yeah, we have people from everywhere. And it's so nice to see people connecting because as we saw yesterday, connecting, joining forces is the first step to face the challenges that the community uh, is facing. So that's really great. And we have a special invitation for you all because I don't know if you hear yesterday from no. Slow News, no. the revolution of Slow News. So if you want to get a free ticket to watch the Slow News documentary in the digital premiere, just click on the link that our team is sharing with you in the chat. There you can register and we're going to send you a code. This documentary just covers the initiatives of different people that are trying to change things in journalism. So if you don't have a plan for this weekend yet, now you have it. Just uh, click on the link, register, and we're going to send you your free ticket via email. Yes, and today we will start with a talk by David Bornstein, the CEO of the Solutions Journalism Network, who will tell us why solutions journalism can lead to more commissions and career opportunities. And then after that, we will look into the world of comic journalism with Priscilla Pacheco from Aos Fatos in Brazil. And we will hear from Sharon Etia from the New York Times, who will tell us how to use Instagram to tell stories and to engage a new audience. And then finally, we have freelancers from different regions in the world who will share their storytelling projects and initiatives. We have mobile journalism, we have graphic novels, and I'm really curious about that session. Yeah, we're going to have great sessions today. And I think it's the perfect moment to thank our 23 partners and friends, organizations, thanks the, to which uh, we could create this event and also a support network around freelance journalists. As always, get, we invite you to check the websites of these uh, news organizations because they are always offering different initiatives, eh, um, schemes, also events, training sessions for freelancers. So visit their websites and take advantage of all their offers. Yeah. And um, on that note, it's also um, important to mention that this conference is not only free and open, but it's also an inclusive space. We are very proud that we have a good energy and that we have a good conduct. And um, to keep those vibes, we invite you to check our no harassment policy that um, our colleague is Angela is sharing in the chat right now. And you know that we always like to have an extra activity. So this time we have a special question for you. Uh, if you could have a skill and you can make a wish to get this skill from one, one day to the other, which one will it be? So our team is sharing with you in the chat one link. Just click there and select the skill that you prefer. Now I'm going to prepare my screen so we can see what is the favorite one from the community. Now you can vote. Which one is, is your favorite one, uh, Estela? Yeah, I was thinking about it and I think I would like to know how to code, but I don't want to learn how to code, you know, there's a difference. <laughs> so I would say maybe photography. Yeah, I know. I think my favorite one is also coding. And the thing is, it takes a lot of time, but it's so important for the community. So that's why I think, uh, yeah, <laughs> I would love to have just uh, this wish and uh, be able to learn it. And now we're gonna share, this screen and you can see 
the results of the community. I'm going to ask my team to share it with the rest of you. And as we were saying, mm -hmm. Stella, data journalism is the favorite one from the community. And then we have video and mobile journalism. So yeah, hopefully in the future, we're going to have uh, one uh, peel of data journalism, and we're going to be able to learn it that fast. That's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. OK, so I think uh, we are ready to start, yeah, Stella. Yeah. I think um, I have one last note before we start. Um, mm -hmm. As you all know, uh, probably since 1992, the EGC has been organizing events like this Freelance Journalism Assembly. And uh, we have empowered thousands of journalists to reinvent their careers, their journalism and their newsrooms. So um, we would like to ask you if you enjoyed your time at the assembly and you want to help us do more for journalists like you um, to join the European Journalism Collective and donate so that we can take this work that we've been doing to the next level. Thank you. Thank you, Stella, for that invitation. So I think now we're ready to go. And it's time to introduce you the first speaker of the day, David Borstein, CEO of the Solutions Journalism Network. Solutions Journalism can benefit society. And actually, it supports healthy democracies and public debate. But did you know that also Solutions Journalists can offer you more career opportunities and commissions? That's right. In this talk, David Borsen is going to tell us how, if you cover solutions journalism, you are going to be able to find new angles that separate you from the crowd. You are going to be able to build a very strong personal brand and become an expert in a specific field. So uh, welcome, David. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Anna. It's great to be here. Um, well. I'm, I am uh, excited to be here. I've been a freelancer my whole life, my whole writing career. I've actually, the only job I've ever had, real job is working for the Solutions Journalism Network. All of the other writing jobs were pitching articles, magazine articles, and eventually books. And I'm excited to talk about, about this topic because it's really, it's actually, I mean, it's a very personal story for me. I, um, I started off as a journalist about 30 years ago and I had to make an early decision back in uh, sort of the early 90s about whether I would try to get a newspaper job at the time, uh, working as a staff writer, or just take my chances as a freelancer. And I'm really glad that I, I, I did the latter route because it's been a really thrilling career. And, and what I've learned um, sort of as a, as a freelancer who sort of stumbled into solutions journalism about, uh, about 30 years ago uh, was that um, I think that there's a bunch of huge opportunities to to have a really thrilling career, a rich career, and I, I wanted to share a little bit about my story and then sort of draw out some of the um, maybe the key lessons, the key things that I've learned from from what happened. I mean, the lessons are sort of <laughs> I, I see them after the fact. I didn't think this way when I was starting out, but but in retrospect, it makes sense. Um, so. Back in sort of 1992, when I was trying to figure out what to um, what subjects to cover as a freelance writer, I heard about the Grameen Bank of Bangladesh, the, the bank that pioneered uh, microfinance, microcredit to um, primarily women villagers in Bangladesh as a way to reduce poverty. Um, for those of you who don't know about the Grameen Bank, it won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006. Um, but I was really, I had a decision and I, I ended up, you know, saving up some money and going to Bangladesh. And I spent a year there researching uh, the Grameen Bank, how it worked, how its approach to poverty worked, did it work, and telling stories about um, or, or, or doing interviews with, with people um, across the country. And what I discovered from that process was it ended up culminating in a book. But, but before it became a book, it was many, many, many newspaper articles, many, many magazine articles that were really addressing a question like how could the world um, do better or take different approaches to, um, to entrenched poverty that were very different from what the World Bank was doing, it was very different from what international aid was doing. And, um, and I, I came up with, I realized that what I, was in, what I was doing was I was kind of slicing the bread very thin. I had a story and I'd spent years researching the story. I mean, a year in Bangladesh, but then many, you know, other years actually looking at microfinance from different angles. And what I found was that was able to produce, it not only led to many articles 
coming in from different angles of the story. But after it produced, after the book came out, I suddenly discovered that I started getting offers to be a speaker. And I was, I was on the tour talking about microfinance and my book for, for a couple of years. And, and in some cases, sometimes getting good speaking fees. And in some cases, you know, people would have me on their radio shows just as a sort of expert on microfinance. I never thought of myself as an expert. I was just a reporter. But because I had gone so deep into the subject and really looked about it, looked, looked, looked in a very deep way, and because I was young and I didn't have a lot of um, expenses, I was able to spend a year in Bangladesh, you know, just with, with um, you know, just to do the research. I didn't have a family at the time. I didn't have a mortgage. And I think that that's one of the main things um, as a journalist, as a freelancer, your competitive advantage is your, your flexibility, the fact that you can travel, you can go deep into subjects. Usually there's other journalists who have more access to publications, more access to certain sources, but you have a, a backpack. You have the ability, in many cases, to, to, to go and to get into stories that other people really can't get into in great depth. Um, after that book came out, I was I all I did the same thing again without realizing it. I was became curious about social innovation broadly and this field at the time that didn't really have a name. It was called social entrepreneurship, or people were talking about it. And I ended up spending another five years just doing research on social entrepreneurship um, in ten different countries. And I, you know, I got I found my I found my way to finance that in different ways. I sold a lot of articles, magazine articles. Um, I was able to really come in with fresh stories because I was looking at things that other people weren't looking at. Like everybody is traditionally the news is covering the problems themselves, poverty, health, refugees, what have you. Um, and there really is, if you ask the question, what's missing? What is missing from the public's, um, public's consciousness that is preventing our society or, or our community from solving this problem? It usually is that people don't really know what their options are. They don't know, they don't, can't answer the question, who's doing better? Or is anyone doing better? Or what's working? Or what is promising? If you don't want to claim that it's working. Um, and, and once you can actually come in with stories like that, um, you know, I, I found that if I was not over claiming, if I wasn't coming into an editor and saying, I, I have the answer to this problem, but I come in with a, but I came in with a more humble sort of like, there's a really interesting model that's emerging in this country. You've covered this issue many, many times, but you've never written about this model. To let the editor have a feeling of kind of FOMO, <laughs> fear of missing out, that there's a part of the story that they're missing. Editors hate to feel that they're missing something important. So if you create that uh, that feeling in them, you you may get them to read your pitch. Um, and what I also found from that book on social entrepreneurship over the years, because a book came out of it, was that I became suddenly I was an expert in social entrepreneurship and I was getting asked to speak at conferences. And I ended up supporting myself for a couple of years, mainly on speaking fees, which was a complete surprise to me. I had never expected that. I'm, a, I'm an introverted person. I really had to learn how to get on stage and, and tell a good story um, in order to do that. So I had to sort of ups, you know, develop those skills. Um, but going back to the, the, those, those, those key messages, um, you know, asking the question, what's missing from the public conversation? What's missing from this story? Is anyone doing it better? It's always a very fruitful story in terms of just coming up with ideas. Um, you can also just, in many cases, you can often pivot off the news. If you see that there's news emerging and everybody, you know, when a news story emerges, everybody sort of runs runs to it the way they kind of run to a fire to sort of cover it. And if you stand back a little bit and can imagine what's going to be after all of this interest in this immediate story extinguishes, what are going to be the questions that people are going to be asking? You sort of give yourself, imagine what's, what, what's going to be in people's mind two weeks from now or a month from now. You can very often pivot off the news because usually once the flashpoint event um, is out of the news and, and people, you know, these stories change so quickly, then the question is, what do we do about this? It's almost always that question. Where is anyone dealing with this? And if you look at so many issues today, whether it's climate change, refugees, um, poverty, people living in poverty in the United States um, or in many countries, um, racial racism, um, 
these stories get covered so often and usually in the way that journalism likes to cover stories, which is our job is to make you care. Our job is to make you experience a sense of outrage. If this is a bad thing, we want you to be really concerned. Um, and very often that's, that's most of what the stories are trying to do. If you think about, you know, sort of journalism as kind of like a, <laughs> a doctor's appointment, you know, a good doctor's appointment helps you diagnose the illness. You have to know the causes, you have to know where it's hurting, you have to know, you know, what the, what, what the illness is. But, you know, you also want to know what your treatment options are. And in fact, that's the most important part of the appointment for most people. They really want to understand what can I do about this. And society is the same way. So while everybody else is running to the fire, if you can step back and start thinking, what's missing? What are people doing about this? Is anyone doing better? Is there any data and evidence about, about models? You can come in with, with something that's genuinely fresh that can advance the narrative when editors are tired of the 50th story about, about that issue. And um, if you do this over and over again, always asking that question, especially if you, if you decide to focus on one particular issue rather than um, becoming an all-purpose all purpose reporter, if you say, I really want to become you know, one of the most knowledgeable reporters in the world about refugees or about you know, responses to climate, um, you can do that. And you can, through solutions journalism, um, you actually can really, really build up um, a deep knowledge or expertise in a particular issue area that's very much focused on the emerging ideas, the emerging possibilities, the experiments, um, how different kind of communities in different contexts are trying to deal with a set of challenges that in many cases the whole world faces. So if you, the more you tell those kinds of stories, once you've told five of them or 10 of them and you've, you've begun to sort of look at this problem from different, it's amazing how much your sort of value to the conversation increases. You know, suddenly you're, um, you're sort of extremely, um, you know, you're sort of indispensable to an important global conversation because you've been covering some of the most important and creative or interesting emerging ideas in this space. Um, and this is a really, I, th I think, you know, as, as you know, when we think about the future of news and how journalism is changing, one of the biggest shifts that we're seeing today is who has power. And the traditional gatekeepers, the New York Times, the BBC, the Guardian, you know, what have you, the traditional news sources that I'm, I'm speaking, obviously, in, in the English language, but, you know, in any language, um, those sources, um, you know, because of the fact that people on social media can reach millions of people um, pretty quickly, the, the real power is shifting to people who truly have something important and relevant to contribute to the conversation, particularly a conversation about how we can build a more peaceful and secure and equitable world. Um, so, and th this is, Solutions Journalism is a really great way to align that idea. Like, as I do my journalism, I'm, become, I'm fortifying myself and becoming stronger, strong, more and more uh, valuable to these, to these important conversations. Um, so that's, so I'm just sort of sharing that that's been my, my personal experience. When we, when I got to the point where um, a friend and I pitched uh, a column to the New York Times about solutions, um, I was able to walk in the door with my friend and both of us, we'd had a similar, her name is Tina Rosenberg, had had a similar journey where we had really carved out a kind of niche for ourselves doing solutions reporting for many years so that when we finally sat down with the editor there to discuss the column, we had a lot of credibility. We were sort of already acknowledged as people who have covered, um, have, have introduced um, really important ideas to public conversations for um, a, con a considerable per period of time. So that's the opportunity. That's the, the way of kind of, um, you know, what, what, what Anna was talking about, your, the way you can sort of create a brand or a sort of career for yourself. Um, and, and at the same time, it really aligns with my motives. I went into journalism because I really wanted to tell stories that could help people see possibilities for a better world. That's just my particular, I mean, um, instinct. You know, I'm, my, my natural instinct is to look for what's possible and try to help that grow. Um, other people want to go into journalism to be more investigative, to, to, um, to be more um, account. Uh, in, in a more direct accountability role. So that's really m very much up to your decision. 
I'm going to pause in 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 a in a couple of minutes to sort of have the questions, but I wanted to you know just get into the issue of of pitching. Um, so we have a bunch of resources on on our blog and on our website um, that could be useful for for pitching. Um, so one of them is is probably the best one is the solutions the story tracker the solutions story tracker which um, I, I gave uh, the links to to Anna so you can she'll 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 um, share them around but the story tracker has um, for those of you who don't know it it has it's a collection of solutions journalism from uh, about 1500 news outlets or 1400 um, and it's about 12,000 stories and what you can do if you search um, through the story tracker is one you can see the kinds of stories that got published where they got published um, and who the writer is and you can kind of get a sense of what's the market for particular kinds of stories who are the journalists doing this what are the publications that seem to be um, uh, seem to be amenable to solutions journalism so that's just a kind of general market analysis that helps you understand um, what the what solutions journalism looks like, and also who's doing it and where it's being published. Um, we also have two other blog posts that looks at what editors are looking for and some other tips for preparing a solutions uh, for preparing a solutions pitch. So um, those we'll send out those links. I don't want to go into the the, the details with, since you can read them yourself. But the the main themes I would say is the the real advantage of a solutions journalism. Um, story or the, or, the, or the way that you can really hook an editor on this kind of story is primarily through um, by, um, you can hear the, the noises in New York behind me, primarily by um, engaging their curiosity. So I, I think the most common mistake that people make is in their pitch, they sort of describe the way this thing is working and why it is working and they sort of give away all the all of the key in, information about the story, and ver and sometimes overclaim. You know that's a big. So when I've been pitching these stories over the years, what I tried to do was to try to lead with something is happening that is not what you would expect, which is typically a solutions journalism story. We call it a positive deviance. There's there's some organization, some community is getting a result against the problem. That isn't the standard result. It appears to be a better result. And you know, you've done your research and from evidence or conversations, you feel pretty confident that this is true. Um, the next thing you want to do is you know, ask a question that gets the editor thinking, how is this working? <laughs> you want the editor to lean in, you want them to want to call you up and say, This is interesting. Can you tell me how it works? Can you tell me what's different about this thing? Now your pitch can suggest that there's some interesting insights in how this is how this is going to work, and they seem to have some, um, you know, a, you know, they've 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 found a way to um, to you know, like when in the case of microfinance, they discovered a way to bank with with villagers in Bangladesh that was completely counterintuitive, and they did this through a whole variety of techniques. Um, once you once you get people curious about how it's happening, that's when you really engage people because that's really the thing that drives a great story is curiosity. People want to know how is this going to work? Is this going to work? What did he do next? What did she do next? And so forth in the narrative. And so setting up your pitches to really drive a sense of curiosity, and not always giving everything away in the pitch because really the goal of the pitch is to get a phone call for to be able to talk through the story or just to get an assignment. So you want to get someone curious enough to say, this sounds interesting. I'm, I'm curious about what's happening. Sometimes they'll ask for more information, but you, you don't want to sort of give away, put everything in the shop window on, on the first thing. At least that's been my experience. And the, um, the other main thing I would say is that traditional journalism is really, really creating extremely harmful distortions today in the world. In the United States, journalism, I can say this without over, you know, um, without overdoing it, Trad traditional journalism has co-authored the narratives, the core narratives that have perpetuated racism in the United States by consistently covering communities of color through a lens of what is dysfunctional for as long as we've had journalism. And so there's a real 
opening today in the field of journalism because of the race, the reckoning around racism um, to do better. And one of the things you need to do is you need to be able to tell whole stories, complete stories about communities that have historically been only described by what's going wrong. Now, there's many communities, not just communities of color, you know, communities experiencing poverty, communities that are suffering in many cases from climate change who live, who live, who live in areas where the only story is that the, you know, they're losing their land or this and this. It's not to overcome, it's not, it's not to dismiss the problems, but to realize that there's a huge need in journalism today to move away from narratives that distort issues that only define people in terms of their deficits and their pathologies, which is a real harmful thing to do, or only describe issues in terms of what's wrong. There's, there's many people who, have, who go into news avoidance or motivated denial by the way we cover climate change. So all that is to say there's a very powerful and serious critique of how journalism has created significant problems in the world today that solutions journalism, it's not the answer to this, but it's certainly one of the important tools in addressing those, those core problems. And so in your pitches or in conversations with editors, um, and we have a lot of sources on our site, we can talk about how we need to correct, we need to correct the record on many, many narratives that have been put out there. And this is one way to do it. More of the same, more of the same journalism as, as high-minded as it may be, can often perpetuate harmful narratives and distortions. So that's a big opportunity today to help people see that this is um, that this is a really important um, additional tool in the journalist's tool belt. So I'm going to pause there, and then um, and we have some time for questions. I think we have ten minutes. Thank you. Hi, David. Thank you so much for this presentation. Thank you. Uh, we have some questions uh, in the chat. Yeah. Uh, we will start with Venita. Venita asks, how can political coverage take on more of the solutions journalism ethos and approach? Yeah, that's a really hard question. Political coverage is one of the areas that is most difficult. Um, now, now, having said that, I mean, you know, there are, play, for, for example, I can speak best about the US and Canada. Uh, there are, if we're talking about problems with democracy or problems with elections or problems with the machinery of democracy, there's usually places that are doing different things. They've, they're organizing elections differently. They're trying to figure out how to mobilize the citizens to vote differently. So you can cover the, the machinery of democracy through interesting experiments. Um, when it comes to covering candidates and the way that they are positioning themselves to run for office, I think one of the most powerful things one can do as a journalist is to find the issues that the candidates keeps talking about. And most of the time they keep talking about the problem, the candidate, and then they talk about what they're going to do about it. When I'm elected, I'm going to X, Y, Z about poverty or about climate. But usually their speeches are deeply underinformed about specifics. So as a journalist or as a news organization, you can, um, you can actually go out and report a number of solution stories in the area and then use those stories to challenge the candidates. What do you think about you know, the housing first model for homelessness, you know, that is that is operating in 20 in 200 cities in the United States. Are you a proponent of it? Then you sort of force the candidates to do more homework to get more to they, they themselves have to actually work harder and get into more specifics. And that's when you really see are people serious. So holding people holding people's feet to the fire and, and forcing them to be more accountable based on real things that are happening that they should know about is a good way for, for journalists to actually improve political discourse, I, I think. Thank you, David. That's a great answer. We Here we have Estela. Estela wonders if it's sometimes hard to evaluate whether a solution solution model is actually impactful. Yes. Great question. Um, 100%. I mean, you know, it sometimes there's no data and no evidence, in which case, it's a new idea that some people are excited about. That's typically why you would have heard about it. Someone mentions it to you or the teachers are excited or the, 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 the nurses or the doctors. Someone has said, this is really interesting uh, or, or maybe the nonprofit or the for-profit or the government program that's advancing this has sent you a press release or however you hear about it. If that's an early stage um, story, there may be no evidence that it's working and in fact, you may find that 
you know, you write about it and a year later you find out that it didn't work at all. That's extremely common. So the, the so journalism is supposed to try to capture things that are emerging. We like new new things. I mean, we like to get fresh ideas and scoops and all that. So how do you cover a story when there's really no evidence of, of effectiveness? Well, one, you can say it's, too, it's premature. I'm not going to cover it yet. I'm going to wait. I'm going to watch it for a while, which is per perfectly legitimate. But then you might lose the story. Then someone else might jump on it, and then you, 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 you don't have your advantage. Another one might be to say, I'm going to write the story, and I'm going to write it just, this is all we know about it right now. And dear reader, we're going to follow this up in a year to see if it worked. And you, you put a note in your calendar to come back to that story once their study comes through or once the, re the data is available or whatever. Because when the, a year later, when you write about it, if the story is it didn't work, that's a very good story. It's a really important story. We can then, then learn why were all these people so excited about something that ultimately failed. It's the suppression of failure that's such a big part of why we keep making the same mistakes over and over again. Surfacing a failure is actually a really good piece of information, and it's a part of solutions journalism. It's a part of understanding what causes things to succeed. The, the, the flip side of that coin is what causes things not to succeed. I mean, they're, they're, they're really in some ways, and if the thing does work, or let's say the data comes out and it's it's so-so, in some areas it worked, but in other areas it was disappointing. It wasn't as exciting as the researchers thought it would be. That's also a very common story. Then you have a more nuanced story where you try to understand what happened. Why did the assumptions, why were not the assumptions, what, which assumptions were correct or which assumptions weren't correct or so forth. But in each case, the most important thing is you can do a story that's very early stage that you can talk about as an emerging idea where there's a lot of uncertainty the verdict is out, and since I'm bringing this to you, to our audience, um, we're going to commit to follow up on this when we know more. Because because if we just, you know, surface the story and then forget about it, it's like what's the point of that? In some ways, we want to cover this as an ongoing conversation. And many many solution stories fall into that category, by the way. Many, especially if they're early stage. We have here a question from Sylvie David. Yeah. Sylvie asks, "Hi, David. Thank you for." Uh, thank you for the presentation. Have you covered about gender equality? And if yes, were there serious difficulties or challenges? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, my, the, the work that I did um, on microfinance for, for many, many years was a gender story. I mean, I, I, I was extremely naive when I went to Bangladesh. I mean, the, the Grameen Bank makes something like 98% of its loans to women in a, in a Muslim society where where there's a convention uh, in the villages known as Purda, where where women are are uh, inhibited very from from sort of being able to move much as freely as men around the around the villages around the countryside. So there's a very strong conservatism in that society or patriarchy. Um, so I would say that you know for me as a as a white man from Canada trying to write about this story. I was completely dependent on really good translators and people to help me understand the nature of that story. So that's a very personal response to that question. Um, but but in terms of, um, I'm not, you know, broadly speaking, things that are working to advance um, greater gender equality. There's many many stories that are that are emerging around the world in terms of. Um, you know, things that are attacking power imbalances, things that are creating greater voice, um, you know, um, in, in, in terms of political processes or in terms of um, places that are putting finance or, or, or the power of, of the dollar into different hands than they were traditionally. You can think of banking or investment stories or so forth. Uh, but I, I, I say that that's a really rich, rich um, um, area for exploration. And we've worked with the Fuller Project um, as well, which is doing, which does really great work focused on primarily on gender. And they have brought a solutions lens to, to a number of their stories. It's a really great publication to check out. <clears throat> we have uh, time for one last question, David. Okay. And it's from Andreas. What is the true meaning of democracy in the time of chaotic paid journalism? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I would flip the question and say, how can chaotic, uh, chaotic journalism uh, still serve democracy instead of being sort of just a, a crazed <laughs> running for the running at the chaos kind of thing? Um, I mean, I guess I get I'm just going to go back to my my core point, which is there are these really important global conversations that are emerging. We're alive at this time in history when we have to figure out, you know, how to, you know, safeguard the environment, not just climate change, but species, biodiversity. Um, we have to deal with massive inequality at the at the global level, and we have to deal with extreme conflict that is that is making the world incredibly insecure and dangerous. To the degree that journalism can speak to those challenges and produce really helpful, useful knowledge to build a better world, um, I think that that is, you know, I, it's, it's hard to always make money in journalism. I spent 10 years without health insurance. I know what that's like. But those seem to me the things that are needed most in the world in terms of ideas, in terms of knowledge. And it feels to me like that's where journalism should um, should really focus. That's where the um, the deepest um, impact will be. And long after we're gone, hopefully it will have made a difference. We hope so too. Thank you so much, David, you. for your time here today. Thank you. Very uh, much. Thank you very much for your talk. I think it's really cool to see that solutions journalism can not only benefit the people that you report on and the readers so that they feel less helpless, but also the journalists themselves because it's such a fresh angle somehow. Um, and I see that we have a lot of follow-up questions in the chat. Um, that means that a lot of people are probably quite inspired at the moment and want to try out uh, solutions journalism for themselves or want to read up on it, um, which is a perfect segue into um, the brand new guide that uh, we have just launched. Um, it's created by and for freelancers, and it has tips and methods and resources on solutions journalism. And uh, Angela is sharing you this guide um, in the live chat right now, so have a look. Um, yeah, and now we are happy to welcome Priscilla Pacheco. She's a reporter of, of Aos Fatos um, and is joining us from Brazil today. And uh, Bris Priscilla will share with us the story behind the solutions journalism multimedia comic Favela versus COVID-19. Welcome, Priscilla. Hi. Hello. Can you see? Can yes. you listen? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, hello. I'm so happy to be attending the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invite. Uh, well, I'm Priscilla Pacheco, a Brazilian journalist based in Sao Paulo. Uh, I will talk about the store that Ionet's comics and solutions journalism, a journalist practice with rigorous coverage based on response to social problems, like David's uh, talk it, uh, now. Well, the store is called Favela and COVID-19. It's about grassroots initiatives that were launched uh, by the residents of three favelas uh, in Sao Paulo to face the problems caused or exacerbated by the pandemic. The favelas are Paraisopolis, and Paraisopolis, the, the people train community leaders. Heliopolis. In Heliopolis, the community leaders uh, use uh, doctors in cars with megaphones and ra uh, radio show uh, to talk with the people about health. And Brazilandia. Brazilandia um, uses uh, music, uses art, uh, hip hop and country music, uh, gra graffiti, uh, Art to to talk to with the people about the the pandemic about the the dangers. Well, this uh, this job uh, was I produced these stores as a freelance journalist last year for the Polish website Outriders, uh, and I think. Um, Yes, they may be. Uh, Lola Garcia talked here too. Uh, 
Uh, Outriders is a non-profit newsroom covering global research, having local impact, and take answers, problems, fears, and needs. It explains things which happen far, but influence your daily life. Well, for this project, we work with people in different countries. I am the Comcast in Brazil, the coordinator Lula Garcia in Spain, and the web designer, web developer uh, in Poland. With this team in different countries, in different places, to have good communication, we use it. Uh, we use it Zoom and Google Meet to old meetings, Slack for daily messages, Google Drive to share fears, work very well. Well, how did I discover the stories about these favelas during the pandemic? Last year, Outriders launched Radar. Radar is a website that shows responses and solutions to COVID effects. And I was the freelance journalist responsible for researching what was being done in Latin American countries. I have completed more than 250 initiatives from Mexico to Uruguay. And among these initiatives, were the stars of Sao Paulo. So our trial is interested in producing a star with more resources. Uh, you are invited to tell these stars because in addition to my experience with solution journalism and getting to know the outskirts of Sao Paulo, I, uh, I had already produced comics. I don't draw but I work in partnership with comic artists. I produce the scripts, for example. And why solutions journalism? Why it is important to tell what was happening in the favelas? Well, because actions were being implemented there that could be replicated in other regions, including outside Brazil like case monitoring, isolation of patients, communication campaigns about what the disease is and how it spreads, prevention, social assistance for the unemployed, actions that can be replicated by other community leaders in Brazil or in other places, but mainly by the governments who have more power and money. Uh, these uh, actions uh, can can be re replicated. So here we we have solution journalists in these stores. The protagon protagonists of the stores are the solution, but we we have the problems. We don't hide the problems, and we don't hide uh, limitations of in initiatives. We show the limitations, we show uh, the problems, but we detail the solutions. Oops. Now about the production. Well, why comics? Outriders is a newsroom that invests in storytelling, and the comic book is an interactive and useful format, format to talking about here talks like a pandemic. And the comic stars have the challenge of saying a lot in a little test. Tests and drums cannot be repetitive. You need to think about this every time. What were the steps for this work? What I suggest for you. Uh, if you would like to, to produce comics, with journalism, uh, solution journalism or other, other kinds. Well, the first step to produce these stars was research. 
I found more information about the initiatives. I studied the territories. For example, how and when the territory was occupied, how the situation of this territory today, because I need to know the territory well to introduce it to people who have never been to a Brazilian, a Brazilian favela. And um, I need to present it without prejudices and without stereotypes. Also, I research data about the pandemic, um, research the economic situation at the time, how was the first population suffering from unemployment and food shortages. I need to understand this to show in my story. The second step was the interviews. The comic artists Alexandre de Maio and I went to Parisopolis, the first favela that I showed, to talk with the community leaders and some residents. We took pictures too, uh, but because of pandemic, it wasn't possible to go there to other favelas. So most interviews were by phone. Well, maybe there is a problem in when we can't to, to go uh, for the to territory because when we're not in the territory, how do we solve the problems of lack of image? To produce comics, we need detailed references. Well, to solve this problem, I asked the interviewers to send portraits, send thoughts of the home, thoughts about the actions, thoughts of family members, send videos about the actions too, and you know which image you need to ask for visits on what the person says during the interview. After, if I, I have time, I will show some examples of pictures that I received for WhatsApp, email, and researched on social media with authorization. Well, the next step is to produce the scripts with the speeds and image suggestions. Then the calm cartoons drafts, the drawings. Finally, the script is sent to be evaluated after approval of the comic artist drafts. We review all the material and it's sent to be translated and assembled into the system, into the website. We started uh, we started producing this store in late July and published it in late October. This project was carried out with the support of the Solution Journalism Network. Now I would like to share some tips uh, if you would like to produce solution journalism, uh, if you are interested in starting to produce, um, as well attend workshops, it's, it's very good, read solution stars. There, there are good examples, good examples in Outriders, Outriders in Outriders, there are other stars about solution journalism. The Guardian, the Guardian has a, a part, a, a page dedicated to solution journalism. If you read Spanish, I recommend it, uh, Redacción from Argentina. It's very interesting. If there is someone here that speaks Portuguese, in Portuguese, there is ECOA by UOL in Brazil, from Brazil. Besides, on the Solutions uh, Network website, there is a credership of Solutions Journalism Store around the world. I think David talked about, about the, this page. Now, about comic. 
about comic journalism. I recommend that you participate uh, of workshops too. And remember uh, an important thing, you can't know how to draw like me, but you need to understand the production to work well in partnership with the comic artists. The, besides a workshop, I recommend, recommend that you read a lot of comic stories. I have some uh, examples I think is, is good uh reads uh, a lot because uh you can uh evalu evaluate the the difference of stairs uh the combination of uh skits and rounds a good uh, example is joy sacco joy sacco is a important name in comic journalism uh Oh, problem with I used finish my my screen here a moment. I think it's very oh. uh, Joy Sako is good reads uh, Joy Sako there is in English <laughs> or and Joy Sako ha has many books. Art Pilgrima it's a uh, a good example. Uh, this book it's very famous too. Oh, I think now it's better because it's uh, there is in English and French and Portuguese. This uh, the photographer. It's about Afghanistan uh, and a good example of combination between uh, comics and pictures i think it's it's bad to to see but uh other references uh this book uh the climate climate changes uh by philip squarezon there there is in english it's very very interesting too From Latin America, a good example, it's Sendero Luminoso. It's a production from, uh, it's a Peruvian, Peruvian uh, production. Uh, from Brazil, if, the, if there are someone here that speak Portuguese or live in Brazil, I have an example, the name is Notas de um Tempo Silenciado, is a comic is about dictatorship in, in Brazil. Other example is this book, Raul, that's uh, produced by Alexandre de Maio, that work with me. Uh, to production this uh, this comics about favelas. Finally, this is my first comics that I produced with Alexandre de Maio about female uh, female football play soccer. The it's it's good uh, have reference uh, reference to to understand uh, how work with this. Well, I have two minutes. The, I will show the, the, the picture is about the favelas and COVID in one minute. A moment. Let me see, I will share my, my screen again. I think it's, yeah, it's possible to know. Well, here, for example, this picture. I, I didn't 
uh, I didn't be in the in this place in this moment. But the people sent for me the picture, and it, it's very important because the the artist come uh, needs to see pictures, to see image, to draw needs uh, to uh, to have uh, references. Here are two of these pictures sent for me. Brazilian just sent pictures to Well, I think my my time finished. <laughs> well, I thank the European Journalist Center for the invitation to participate in this event now. Uh, we have questions. Oh, Priscilla, thank you very much for this amazing presentation. And I think the message for the community is uh, don't be shy and think big because it's always possible to use different formats to tell stories. It takes time. And of course, it requires collaboration, requires a lot of elements. Uh, sadly, we don't have time for questions now, ah, but thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, well, I invite you to join the YouTube streaming, uh, Priscilla, so you can answer mm -hmm. the questions directly uh, in YouTube. And now ah, okay. I think, uh, oh, thank you, Priscilla. Thank you, thank <laughs> So now it's time to uh, move on, and I would like to invite Sharon Atia, social media editor at the New York Times. In this session, Sharon, will tell us about the best practices for posting on Instagram and how to create shareable and engaging content that is going to help you to uh, increase the visibility of your work, to amplify your voice, and also to connect with your audience. So thank you and welcome, Sharon. Thank you so much for having me. Um, you can see my screen, right? I'm sharing. Is perfect. Um, Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. Um, today we're gonna talk about Instagram for freelancers. And so you could think of this session as a guide for journalists, editors, photographers on how to be good on Instagram. And I promise you, it's a lot easier than it looks. <laughs> Um, just a little bit about me. I'm a freelance photographer currently based in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and I've been a social media editor at the New York Times since 2018. So before we get started, why Instagram? Why should you be on this platform? Why is it important? Um, the easy answer, it's a really powerful way to tell stories and reach a brand new audience. Of Instagram's 1 billion users, 86% live outside the United States and 70% are younger than 34 years old. That means that's an opportunity to reach a younger global audience who may be encountering your journalism for the very first time. And just a, a little reminder, I like to tell people, Instagram isn't just a place for memes and well-lit shots of your coffees. Um, it's also a place where people come for their news, which I feel like previously we always thought of Twitter as the news platform and Instagram is sort of the fun pictures, but Instagram has really changed in the last few years and now it very much is a news platform as well. So um, what should you be doing on Instagram? Um, I, if, if you can leave with one really big takeaway, it's that you should be keeping it real and being your authentic self. Um, people wanna feel that there's really a human behind the account and they're looking for accounts that feel personal and have a voice that's informative, trustworthy, approachable, which is precisely what you as journalists can offer. Um, often the most successful accounts are identity driven and have a clear point of view. So race, gender, environmental justice, or in the journalistic sense, they have a specific beat or focus on a specific topic or area of expertise. So for example, at the New York Times, um, the account that I run um, is NYT Gender. And so we really focus on um, women and gender issues in the news. Um, what should I be doing on Instagram? So kind of two big buckets, um, share being one of them, share your journalism in your feed and stories. We'll talk a little bit about what exactly I mean by share and how you can do that in the most engaging way. 
Um, and one of those ways, if you have a finished product, a, a link you want to direct people to, there are ways to link to your work in Instagram. I know, again, like Twitter is obviously more of the clicking through platform, but you can add swipe ups in stories or in your link in bio. And, and so you can take people off platform to um, engage with your work. Um, and also offer your followers a behind the scenes look into your process and reporting. People really want to know what like, who you are, what's the person, the journalist behind the byline, and Instagram really is a platform that rewards that behavior. And two, interact. Um, respond to comments and questions on your posts, respond to DMs um, and replies to your stories, and also use the native features in that Instagram offers, like story, stickers, um, polls, questions. Um, I, I really like to tell people it's important not to take people for granted who are taking the time to engage with your work. Um, and also there is a benefit to you in that Instagram really rewards people who are spending a lot of time on their app. So if you're replying to comments and you know watching stories, you're actually more likely to reach a new audience or an audience that isn't following you because the app is rewarding active users. So it kind of sends a signal to Instagram oh, this person really is using this platform, I'm going to boost them on the explore page. So I've been talking, I said stories and feed, and so just a really quick, what's the difference between the two? Um, so feed is what you're probably typically, is more traditionally what we're thinking about when we talk about an Instagram post. Um, it's square or like a four by five. Um, it could be a photo, a visual, a video. Um, they don't expire. They live on your profile, you know, forever unless you delete them. Um, they usually reach a larger audience. Just typically, um, the interactions are going to be higher. Um, you can edit them. You can edit the captions. You can change, you know, the the location. Um, and videos have to be a minute or less. IGTV, I'm not going to touch on, but that's longer form video on Instagram. And then stories. Um, which we're going to get into in a little bit, are the vertical aspect ratios. They're definitely more casual, experimental. They have a more in the moment, um, I would say, vibe to them. Um, they can't be edited, though, which is sometimes a little bit annoying for us like journalist editors who sometimes want to edit our work. You'd have to take it down and redo it if you, if you needed to edit something. Um, and basically, it's a way to tell a story in multiple parts. So each slide is going to be no more than 15 seconds. So now we're going to get into best practices for the two. Um, best practices for posting in feed, um, you know, there are multiple elements to it. So for your captions, I mean, this is a session full of journalists. So, you know, what you always do, which is informative, trustworthy, conversational type of um text is really what we're looking for. Um, I feel like maybe a few years ago, people tried to keep the captions really, really short. That's definitely changed. There's people are doing their line breaks, you can do a couple paragraphs. But also still, you know, you don't want it to be an essay, like you want to be quick and approachable and grab your audience. Um, engage. So you really like you should be inviting the audience in if you can ask questions in your in your caption, create opportunities for that audience to participate and engage with you. Um, but just something to remember, if you are asking people, you know, a call to action, you're asking them a question, make sure that you engage with it back. Because the last thing you want is to kind of build this audience that you're trying to build trust with, and then they feel like they're participating and throwing their stories into a void. Um, links, um, so you can include a link directly in the caption on Instagram. Um, however, uh, you can, as the cool kids say, uh, like drop a link in bio. Um, so you can only have one link in your bio, but rather than swapping it out, a lot of journalists are using free tools like Linktree um, that will allow you to link to like an unlimited number of links. So this is a really good tool if you're constantly trying to share some of your work off platform. Um, hashtags. Don't spam. <laughs> um, hashtags um, should be used around very specific or niche topics. I would say events or a certain day are really useful for those because people are really looking for everything that has to do with that day. Um, but content, like hashtags are a way to filter content, right? And, and you won't surface if you're using a hashtag that has hundreds of thousands or millions 
of um, followers or uses. So it's really important to be specific. And um, what I like to do is think of ways that the hashtags can organically fit into the caption. So rather than tack them on at the end, you know, like 30 hashtags, which feels very spammy, um, is there a way to organically, you know, use it within the caption? And not, you know, not for every single word because it's very hard to read. For these big words where you're trying to get that audience who's interested in that topic to maybe find your post. Um, and location tags. Location tags are actually really, really great to use. Um, and I feel like people sometimes sleep on them. Um, they can signal to your followers where you are. So if you're trying to build an audience that, you know, is very localized or that is connected to the location that you're in, it's a really nice signal that you're actually based and embedded in that region. Um, it also allows your post to be more discoverable. And um, similar to hashtags, location tags, it's really good to be specific. Um, so for example, if I was posting from New York, rather than posting New York City, I would do Central Park, because if someone were to click on that, it actually would filter into the New York posts as well. Um, don't obsess over the grid. This sometimes is hard to hear for our photographers and, and you know, really people who are really loving aesthetic. Um, but 99% of engagement happens in your feed, not in your profile. And, and so you don't need to worry about like posting in threes or making the colors match. It's, it's not where people are spending their time. Um, okay, best practices for stories. So Instagram stories is the fastest growing feature on the platform. It has hundreds of millions of daily active users, a majority of whom are millennials and Gen Z. Um, I know, for example, for me, every morning when I wake up, I don't scroll through my feed. I actually watch stories first. That's that's a very common you know, user habit. Um, so some things to think about, stories are vertical, and so you should be shooting and uploading stuff that feels vertical, so it doesn't feel like you're forcing like a, your median on to the wrong platform. Um, quantity, eight to 11 slides tends to be the sweet spot, um, but like it's fine if you do less and if you do more, but it's important to how you're telling the story, that's also fine. It just might affect your completion or drop off rate a little. Um, selfies. So this kind of goes back to how people really want to know the human behind the account. Um, straight to camera, kind of selfie style footage, reporter on the ground stuff um, is really what people want to see. Um, they want to know, you know, who you are, who is the journalist that they want to put their trust in um, and and um, the native features of Instagram. Right. So I, I touched a little bit there, are like question stickers. There are polls. Um, I know a lot of reporters who use it as part of their reporting process. You know, you can poll your followers or have them ask questions that can inform the coverage, your coverage, both on and off platform. Um, and and take us on the ground with you. You know, you're in a unique position to bring on the ground reporting to people where they're spending most of their time. So talking to camera footage um, is a really compelling way to draw your audience in and then also explain a complicated story or add some personality behind that byline. And, and just something to note, 40% of users um, who will encounter your content are doing it without audio. Um, so some things that you can do is if you want to add like a sound on sticker to signal that there's going to be audio that they should turn on. And also from a really important like accessibility point of view, um, you should you can type out, you know, your closed captioning just on Instagram, or there's tons of uh, free apps that will caption auto caption um, your videos for you, excuse me. Um, and this question is kind of something that I always come back to. What is the most compelling way to tell the story? Um, Instagram at the end of the day is a visual platform, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean exclusively photography, which is how the app definitely started. Um, when you're posting, you should ask yourself, you know, what is the best way to have my audience engage with this story? What do I want them to take away from it? Maybe that's a headline card. Maybe it's you know an impactful quote or statistic. Um, maybe it's promoting the finished product of your piece of journalism. You know, a photo of it in print in a magazine in the newspaper, or a screenshot of like the headline and the image on the site. Um, or or maybe it's a you know a window into your reporting process. People love behind the scenes, it, it doesn't matter uh, in what context, they feel like they're getting kind of a VIP exclusive look into you know how something is made. 
And yeah, thank you so much. Um, we can take questions now. Hi, Sharon. Hi. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. We have a few questions here in the live chat for you. So let's start with Vinita. Vinita asks, is one single photographer, photographer photograph on Instagram on an important issue considered completely impactful? Yeah, so this is tough, right? Because I think sometimes a photograph is, you know, a picture tells us is a th worth a thousand words. Sometimes an impactful photograph really is the best way to tell the story. But I think what we're learning more and more, especially with journalism, sometimes maybe you don't have a photograph. Maybe you're currently reporting it. Maybe it's a piece of audio journalism. And, and so I think there really, there's a, a variety of entry points that you can do. So sometimes like a quote card, really text over images, there, there are plenty of ways. And Instagram really is rewarding this diversity of media on the platform. I think we haven't seen for a while, you know, only photographs. There's, there's so many things. And so I don't, I just always want people to take away that if you don't have a photograph, that doesn't mean if you don't take photos, that doesn't mean you, you can't be on Instagram because there are so many ways to, to impactfully tell your story that aren't exclusively photography. Exactly. Uh, we have another one from Esther. Do you think frequency is the key to success? How often should we be posting on the feed and stories? That's a really good question. I, I get that a lot from our reporters at the Times. Um, Instagram isn't a one size all like one size fits all platform. You know, some some people the cadence is once a week. Some people are posting every day. Some people it's less frequently. I will say though, consistency is really key, right? So in, in building that trust with your audience, people can really pick up on the signal. So it's okay if you're posting only once a week, as long as you know you're not then not posting for three months and you fall off the grid. Um, and I will say, like most social media apps, Instagram wants you to be spending a lot of time on the app. So the more you post, the more likely or rapidly you are to maybe build a bigger audience because the platform is saying, oh, this person is on all the time. I'm going to boost them into the discovery pages. Um, so, but like, you know, you need to find that balance for yourself, definitely. We have here Andrew. Andrew asks, how long does a small team or individual spend on designing an Instagram story for a larger written future? Yeah, um, I will say sometimes like it takes practice. It used to take me a really long time um, and now I feel like I can do it very quickly. A couple things that are really important. Um, I know we're probably seeing more and more, you know, even people on their personal accounts, it'll feel very designed and polished. There are a lot of websites, you know, that will have Instagram story templates for you, which are really great tools. And, and I encourage you to use those if like it's easy to plug into a template. But something that I just like want you to know, you don't have to be a designer, a graphic designer, a photographer to be good at Instagram. People actually might drop off more if it looks really polished or like an ad because people will think it's sponsored content and they're actually might be more likely to skip if it feels too produced when it's coming from a human's account rather than, you know, a brand media account. Um, something that I, I has really, really helped me is when I'm thinking about Instagram, it's not an afterthought. It's not only thought of as a promotional lever for the journalism. So if you have a big piece of journalism coming or a project, think, start thinking about Instagram and, and Twitter and, and social media just in general as part of the editorial plan. Um, and then it really helps you just think about it as one more way to tell the story. You know what I mean? In the same way that we're thinking about like, oh, I'm going to do this Twitter thread. What's the Instagram way that you're going to tell that story? Thinking about it ahead of time will really, will save some time. And also I think sometimes make the journalism better because you're, you're, you're meeting your audience where they are. We have here one question from Rosalind. Uh, Rosalind says, it's difficult to balance between using Instagram for personal and professional purposes. How to maintain personal cyberspace while promoting myself as a professional journalist? I I feel you 100%. Um, that balance, that line is really, really tricky. Um, I think it kind of depends, right? I know a lot of people who've created kind of two accounts 
kind of a Finsta, a fake Instagram or a personal Instagram for whatever it is they want to do. You know, their friend picks, their food picks, or or just something that feels separated from their news so that they're not, that they have that separation. And other people will blend them. I think it kind of also, sometimes I just log off I, for the weekend. Sometimes I'm like, okay, I'll catch up Sunday night before work. I need a break because, because Instagram isn't, escapism anymore like we were getting our news there and sometimes that can feel like work um yeah it's a tricky question i can't say that i successfully have found that balance um so i, I don't know that i have all the answers for that one um but i will say that you sometimes you could also just mute certain accounts on them it, it really depends it, it, it's tough i am on instagram so often so many hours of my day. I get alerts on my phone telling me how many hours I spent on Instagram. So I'm not the expert on that one. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> uh, Michelle Ferguson asks, should you only be pointing to your original content? It is different from Twitter in that way mm. where you can retweet others' content. And he adds, like, for example, if you were doing research and came across something interesting, could you share it on Insta as a quote or a stat? Totally. That's a really, really good question. And I almost included a slide about this in my presentation. So the nature of like how we share and retweet on Twitter, that's starting to become part of the user behavior on Instagram. You can share other people's work in your stories, which functions essentially the same way as a retweet, right? You share someone's feed post and you post it to your story and you can add your commentary in the same way that you would quote tweet. Um, when it comes to sharing in feed, I think generally, the idea or the understanding for a lot of people is that what's in your feed is coming from your voice. You're the expert. It's your work. And so if you are going to pull like a stat or, you know, an interesting piece of research, I would just like say, think about, is that your beat? You know, is that your area of expertise? And, you know, people are thinking, oh, I'm following you for X subject matter of news. And so if you're pulling that statistic and giving it that context and um, att attributing it to wherever you find it from, I think that's totally okay. It really depends on kind of what is the nature of your account. But in terms of just general shares and retweets, stories is really the place for that. We have one more question from Gaura. Gaura asks, hi, Sharon, as someone who works for a big media organization as the New York Times, what major difference did you notice in terms of curating for Instagram for a freelancer? Yeah, um, I would say the biggest thing is probably the voice. I think sometimes as journalists, we think we have to be maybe a little bit, you know, objective or detached to, to make it sound like the the voice of the publication that we're writing for often. And on Instagram, people don't want that. Like people want to hear, do you have any, you know, an interesting anecdote or something from the reporting process or um, it doesn't have to feel as polished. Um, like we're, we're not really in the age of hyper filtered, very clean photos. Like a lot of people also, if you're a reporter who's very active on Twitter, I just want to say it's super okay if you had, if you did a t thread or a tweet that you thought was really good and you screenshot that and, you know, maybe you put it on a background so that it fits perfectly on Instagram and you make that the post and then you write a little bit more in the caption. That's one, you know, you, you don't need to be making a million things. You also have your own job to do. Um, but uh yeah, it's definitely different. I would say from a big, big media orgs, we're trying to be a little bit more of the like, you know, parent, professional kind of institutionalized voice. And as freelancers, you really have the benefit of doing what Instagram wants, which is being personal and authentic and having a specific point of view, which is really what is the most successful on the platform. And we have here Leo that asks, what do you think about the live streaming or ongoing story? Mm. So lives are, there definitely, it, it depends on how active you think your audience is. Is there really, do you, do you feel like when they're watching the live, um, that is the best way to tell the story? I would say for a major breaking news event, if you're on the ground and you want to provide someone with that live, amazing that, you know, you're in a unique position to offer them that, um, that entry into that news moment. 
However, I will say a lot of things sometimes they do better not as alive because then you can help the reader or the audience understand what it is that's going on, right? Which is like what we do as journalists, we're there in the action and then, you know, we make it more accessible and digestible. And so I think for lives really just want to be thinking about if someone's just opening this without any context, are they getting anything? Like, is it impactful? Are they, or are they confused? Um, and, and so just thinking about that, but if you can go live, great. I, I know a lot of uh, reporters are also doing like conversations or they'll do a dual live with someone else. And that's really nice because that'll signal to both of your audiences that you're live. And so you're potentially reaching even more people from that other person's um, audience, which is great. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you so much Thank for you so much for having me. For talking about Instagram for freelancer. It was great. We learned a lot. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. You too. Bye bye. Yeah, thank you, Sharon. That was really a great mix of this bigger picture strategic guidance and then some really smart tips. And it's really reassuring to hear that this authentic voice is more important than having the perfect polished photograph. I think that's where we might get hung up on. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. It's now um, time to move on to discuss uh, one of the probably most stressful parts of being a freelancer, which is uh, money and funding for your project. Um, and we are very happy to welcome Stefano Valentino. He's a freelance journalist and the founder of Mobile Reporter. And um, he will share some tips on how you can optimize your grant application game, which I'm sure is something that many of you are interested in. So welcome, Stefano. Hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, giving me the chance to, uh, to make my presentation today. So <clears throat> let's forget about uh, social media, Instagram, all these uh, high-tech uh, innovations. Now we are going back to old-fashioned, uh, longer-term time-consuming journalism, which is exactly what I'm doing. So um, mm -hmm. I will tell you uh, some tips how to make the miracle, meaning making money with investigative journalism, which nowadays has become a kind of um, hard endeavor. So. The second presentation is called From Publishing to Earning to Earning to, to Publishing. So the idea is moving uh, from uh, what we call the news-based journalism to project-based journalism. So the problem is our, our journalists, we have a lot of uh, ideas, even too many sometimes. The problem is selecting the right ones to boost um, income. And uh, I don't want to sound like a materialistic guy. Actually, it's precisely because I'm very realistic and uh, I want to do the stories that I like. I want to choose my topics. I don't want to take commissions uh, from editors all the time. That's why I try to create my business model, which is based on projects rather than on uh, news coverage. So um, that's the question, the dilemmatic uh, question. Uh, there are two models. Uh, you can pick the one you want. So the conventional model is that uh, when you have uh, an idea, and if you want to pitch it uh, right away to editors, and they start calling and emailing like crazy uh, all your contacts. Uh, the thing is that uh, you have um, a pro of this, that uh, when you get commission, uh, then uh, you're sure that you're going to pay. But sometimes the remuneration are very low. So that's why I put a two zero here uh, rather than the three that you're going to get in the other model, which is the risky way, which is precisely the model that I adopt, uh, so instead of uh, basically pitching my story to an editor for the day, for the, to publish a story for, uh, I mean, uh, the, the short term, the day after or the week after, I do, uh, I amplify, I do further research. And when I have uh, a more research project, I pitch it to grant contests or grant makers. So grant makers are uh, organizations, philanthropic organizations, which have the mission of uh, Supporting uh, investigative journalism. So they have uh, calls uh, with specific deadlines every year. Sometimes they are uh, thematic, sometimes they are open to every topic. And then journalists, they can submit their projects. And uh, the grant maker chooses the, the, the project that, that uh, considers the, the most uh, interesting and, and, and the feasible. And then if you are lucky, uh, you get the money. So the pro is that uh, if you win, you're really going to get a lot of money. And if you don't win, you are just wasting your time. Sometimes it also happens to me. Um, so, which is the model which uh, works better for you? Well, if you are an uh, adrenalinic uh, guy who wants to be all the time on the really on the headlines, 
covering uh, breaking news every day. You want to feel uh, the, the excitement of uh, you know uh, going after the, the last uh, news and everything. So maybe the news-based uh, model is for you. Uh, of course, the, um, <clears throat> you are going to get uh, less money for uh, for uh, stories, so you need to work uh, and produce uh, more many stories every day, every week. And um, the pro is that uh, you have a specific deadlines, which are set by editors. You don't need to bother too much about time planning. When the deadline is there, the only thing you need to do is stress out and keep uh, an eye on the watch and then find the, finding your stories uh, um, before it's too late. And you can uh, cover many topics. So if you get bored with one topic, you can cover many topics uh, depending on the, on, the, on the news. The cause is that uh, you have a little, little lower time, less time to do research to check the, the information. So sometimes the quality is not as good and, uh, and um, you're going to get lower expertise. So you're not going to be a specialist or anything. You're going to, to be kind of a multi, multi-topic uh, journalist. Project-based uh, project journalist, uh, you have uh, more money for whether to win the grant and then you can slow down. Once you get the grant, you can slow down your, uh, your uh, working pace, meaning that you have much more time to dedicate to the research. You can increase your quality, you can expand uh, your leads uh, everywhere, and uh, you're going to enjoy your time while actually becoming an expert and producing the most accurate story you want to have. Of course, it's going to be time consuming, meaning that uh, you need to plan your schedule. You don't have an editor telling you and calling you, listen, you need to find the story. It's you. We need to be self responsible, dis disciplined, and, uh, and set your milestones so that you're going to uh, do research and uh, be sure that you're going to publish the story at the deadline that you agreed with your founder. The other uh, con uh, cons is that you have a low, lower topic diversification. So, um, it, I mean, if you, if you like to be eclectic, then uh, maybe that's not uh, the good, uh, the good model for you. You, 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 you are going to do maybe three, four projects per year on covering three, four topics. Maybe you want to have a uh, much more diversification in your life. So it's up to you. But you're going to get uh, much more, more expertise and you're going to become an expert and a reference for your uh, mid editor. When, when they want a story from you, they know that you're going to produce the best story on this, that specific topic. You're going to build your reputation. So, uh, how to win a grant? That's a question that uh, probably most of you would like to ask. So, I anticipate you. So, you need to be very con convincing. When you're submitting a project, you need to be very clear with your objective. You cannot propose a topic like, I want to investigate uh, COVID. No, you are going to submit a story saying, I want to investigate how big pharmaceutical companies try to get uh, maximized profits from selling vaccine through lobbying on the European Commission, for example. That's a very clear topic. Then the, your topic needs to be relevant. Okay, it needs to be somehow, 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 somehow exposing uh, wrongdoings or uh, or uh, issues which uh, have, have uh, public, uh, public, uh, public importance. Then you need to show that you have done preliminary research. Your research needs to show that uh, you are really, you are really digging, digging uh, hard. You have a methodology, and you already found out some hints which give an indication that your story is feasible. That you just need to gather evidence to prove the hypothesis that you already done your preliminary research. Okay, they not give you the money just to start your research, they will give you the money to gather the evidence to prove the hints that you already put on the table. Then you need to have a killing evidence gathering plan. You need to show exactly which are the stages through which you are going to gather all the evidence to prove your hypothesis. And again, you need to show that you have, you are the best at doing this story. You are, you are a specialist, you have everything in your background, you know, the topics, the technicalities, everything. Of course, you need to produce a project. You need to type the project in a way that it already shows that you can write in a compelling way, right? So when you write the project, just think that you are going to write, you're writing the final story, the outcome, the output. The jury wants to see that you are going to tell the story in an exciting way for readers. And then you need to uh, share a consistent budget. So you don't need to overestimate or underestimate your expenses based on different activities you're going to do. Then you need to show that you have access to sources. You have collaborators who can help you in a situation, in, in, in a regions, in locations where you can don't have direct access. That you have partners, for example, for example, research centers, NGOs, uh, consultants 
that are, that are specialists that will provide you with the evidence you, you, you need. It's, if it's a, a local or international story, we need to show that uh, you can provide uh, a very specific angle or a wider global angle. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, it's, uh, if uh, you're going to cover a global story, you need to show that uh, you have a cross-border team, meaning that you can partner with collaborators, journalists in other countries, which will help you to gather information on the field, because you cannot travel everywhere, as you know, mostly in COVID times due to the travel restrictions. And then, very important, you need to prove that uh, your story is going to be disseminated. You're going to maximize the distribution of the story, so then the grant, the grant maker can go back to its founders and say, you see, I found it, this journalist, he produced uh, lots of stories on the many media. Now you see that I'm, going, I'm, I'm using your money to, to subsidize stories which have a wide audience. So then uh, the founder of your uh, grant maker is going to give even more money to your grant maker, and grant maker is going to be happy and grateful to you and maybe give you more money at, uh, at the next application. Then you need to have a commission letter from media outlets, editors, to prove that uh, you have contacts and you don't want to publish the story. And you, you need to have a specific time frame. You say that you're going to publish the story in uh, six months, one year, but not 10 years, 20 years, right? Otherwise, it's no longer news, but it's a book or encyclopedia. Then, uh, um, when you have a project ongoing, you already have to think about the next project, right? You don't have to wait until your uh, funding is over and you have empty pocket again. So you need to check regularly for new grants and I share with you a couple of links. The Journalist Fund is the largest uh, grant maker for journalists, investigative journalists in Europe, based in Brussels, where I am now. The Pulitzer Center is uh, in the US. Both of them, they, they have uh, uh, different uh, rounds uh, for application uh, uh, throughout the year, uh, to which you can have some different kind of projects. And they really, they really want to have collaborative projects. So be sure that you have collaborators across board. EGNet has an interesting uh, a newsletter to which you can uh, subscribe. And you have lots of uh, opportunities, grant, grant making opportunities, everything. I get most of my information on the new application rounds there. Then you need to pile projects. I mean, you, you, you become a specialist on different topics. So you need to you continue your research anyway. You need to uh, create new projects based on uh, on uh, your research research topics all the time, and uh, it, it seems like uh, an impossible me mission impossible. But uh, when you become a specialist, you understand the new leads, new possible topics so fast. Then your continuous, not ongoing, endless research always ends up into embryonal or uh, or projects uh, projects uh, pitches. Then, for example, you can uh, uh, match. Uh, your research with the new grants which are coming. So, for example, your research a specific topic, there is a new grant which is giving out money for our projects on these specific topics. And yes, you're going to match your, the research you have done, which you seems to seem seem, seem to be useless until uh, that moment. But then you have a grant which wants exactly project on that specific project that on that specific topic that you research. Well, that's the time to go. Then you can basically submit the same project to different grant making uh, uh, calls. It happens to me that I, I, get, I win a grant, then there is another grant uh, covering the same topic, so I submit exactly the same project, and then you create what they call the snowball effort. I mean, you, you move from grant to grant until, until basically with one, set, with one unique project, you can basically boost and, uh, and, uh, and uh, cash a lot of money. Uh, you can upgrade old projects with new leads, so the old project which has already been funded, so the research is, has already been funded, can become a new project that you can submit. You need to blog to grant makers, you need to show that you are doing research, that you publish stories. You need to blog, even share stories with the new grant makers, so they know that you already have, you already have a track record, a history of, 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 uh, grant, um, of winning uh, grants, so you have already kind of uh, reliable and you have a reputation. So they know that the way you're going to say, submit a project to their calls, you are not a newcomer. You are someone who has already won grants from, from other grant makers. Some examples of projects funded that I've done recently. One is on COVID, which was funded by, um, by a call, which is going to be, uh, again, uh, open in, uh, uh, in July. It's called Investigative for uh, the EU. So check it out. It's the deadline is uh, July 15. 
Then you have um, a project on a cross-border project uh, that I did with uh, did with a uh, journalist from uh, Sierra Leone. Basically, we track down uh, the illegal fishing activities of Italian vessels, which are fishing uh, in a restricted area of the coast of Sierra Leone. Very time-consuming, very rewarding. Uh, the, the the shipping companies in Italy they went bankrupt because nobody wanted to buy fish from them anymore after my story was out. Uh, and uh, I like fish, so unfortunately I need to buy the fish from other uh, uh, shops. And then you have a couple of stories that I produced for my network, which is the European Data Journalist Network, which is a platform affiliating different media outlets with share and co-produce stories based on data. So they also have a small fund, internal fund, so they sub subsidize these uh, two stories, one on the lobbying of big tobacco in the EU, one uh, on uh, palm oil uh, driven deforestation in Indonesia. So, um, if you feel like that uh, you are wasting a lot of time to produce stories which are not uh, well paid by your editors, then you can uh, email me. I will give you some tips on how to move from a news based to project based journalism. We can also collaborate. You have ideas. We can try to do projects together and uh, make uh, uh, um, mutually happy uh, through earning more money. So, now open for questions. Hi, Stefano. Ciao. Thank you so much for your presentation. We start with the questions and answers now. And there is a question that, in, that the son of the um, attendees uh, are um, asking in the chat. That is this one that Michelle wrote. So do you need a news outlet to commission you before you apply to the grant? Yeah, sure. If you, sh if you attach uh, editor's uh, letters, you really have 50% uh, more chances to win, yes. Because you will guarantee that we are going to publish the story you are going to give credit, you are going to increase the visibility of your grand maker towards its own funders. Yes, sure. We have here another question from Sylvie. Hi, Stefano. What running stories could you advise that might be worth it for Grant? <coughs> well, one of the stories that uh, were funny that I shared with you was about COVID. For sure, COVID, the pandemic, it's, uh, it's, uh, that's the issue now. Uh, but it's also um, um, overreported, so you may have difficulties to find the new leads. But uh, I think that uh, <clears throat> I think what is trending now is actually investigate uh, the flaws, the loopholes in uh, in the, our economic uh, and production system, which is contributing to uh, ecological disasters, public health crisis, climate change. I think those long-term topics, which were relegated to uh, is short news in the past. Now, due to climate change uh, movement, through the pandemic, now they've become very important. So I think that uh, you should invest time to do research on these, uh, let's say, um, long-term public interest issues where, um, where uh, you can uh, expose the conflict between the lobbying, which are trying to keep the statu quo, that which are uh, trying to slow down innovation and uh, in the transition to a more sustainable, and the more healthy uh, economic uh, system. And uh, this is the kind of story that actually works well for project-based journalists because they're, they're not breaking news. They're not going to compete in the arena of, of, uh, of uh, daily reporters. This is the, the kind of project which takes time, which is time consuming, that need to be researched. And they always, you we always find a hook in the news, basically, uh, that will give you the pretext to publish your final stories. Everybody's going to talk about health crisis and uh, ecological crisis, climate change, over, uh, over the next uh, 100, 200 years. Maybe we are not going to live so long, but uh, we have a lot, lot of time, <laughs> long time to, to work. We have uh, here one question from Tomas Gaugeiro. Uh, Tomas asks, quite often the grants I find are for institution or institutions or for groups. Working as a freelancer for a journalist, could you advise some sites to be up to date with grants for a smaller project? So um, uh, I work as a freelancer, so I, I, I'm a kind of uh, one man team. But uh, usually, I, when I submit my grants, I have names or collaborators in the team. Uh, sometimes those collaborators they only help you with a little bit, but having them on your project is very important because you show that uh, you are you are uh, basically you, you you have skills in managing a team, so managing projects, and you show that uh, you can have people that uh, work and support you and do 
part of the research with you when you don't have access to information. So what is important, you really build up the team. And then uh, if you have colleagues or friends who work in journalism, you just tell them, can I put your names and then you give me a little, bit, a little bit of help. But building up, building up a team on paper is very important. Uh, grants for our small projects, well, all the grants that I mentioned, the Pulitzer Center and the Journalist Fund, they provide grants of different size. If you have a big project, uh, a large cross-border project, which involves a big team with three, four journalists in different countries, then, of course, you can uh, ask for more money. If you have just one with other colleagues uh, uh, somewhere else, then you can submit a project for, uh, for, uh, with a smaller budget. So it doesn't really depend on the grant-making organization. It really depends on the kind of projects and the budget, uh, the money you need to, uh, to, uh, to compete. We have one question from Vinita that comes from yeah. Nepal. So how can freelancers from Nepal be more relevant and resonate in the global stage, mm -hmm. where a small Himalayan nation and there are tough international priorities we must align to? Well, this question uh, really grabs my heart because I went to Nepal and they visited the Himalaya and I love it. So. I'm not very objective on this question. The Himalaya is very important. I mean, it's uh, one of the, it's called the third pole on the earth. As you know, it's, uh, it's uh, considered one of the largest uh, uh, ice, uh, ice uh, water storage on, on earth. Ice melting uh, in the Himalaya can, uh, is, has, a, has a, an impact which goes well beyond the border of your country. And um, so I think that there is a lot of uh, room for uh, environmental reporting in Himalaya. And, uh, I mean, there are also, I know, dam projects uh, on the border with India, China, which create issues for uh, access to water in uh, downstream uh, communities um, and, uh, and uh, safety in case of a, of a break of a dam. So I think from an uh, environmental perspective and the community rights perspective, there is a lot to do in, in, uh, in Nepal. Of course, if you want to have access to international media, then what I suggest is that you get in touch with the reporter in the Western world, like Europe and US, and you create uh, a, a project cross border together with him, and then you pitch it uh, uh, individually to different uh, grant makers. Uh, there are grant makers which give money only to reporters in developing countries, and Nepal is one of those. Other grant makers, they give money to international projects. So for example, you could create your project with an international reporter, and then you pitch individually. He will pitch to inter the international grant, you will pitch to uh, the regional grant, and if you are really successful, you get the money, both of you, and then you are going to invite me to have some champagne for my advice. <laughs> and, you... <laughs> <laughs> and you will deserve it. <laughs> we have time for one last question. Oh, we don't have, Anna. Yes, I think we have time for the last question. Go ahead. Yeah, yes, I came in right now. It's from Macari. Um, could you recommend how we can find and identify organizations that award grants and where to start? So uh, in one of the slides, uh, I can put it back if you want, uh, or, uh, or maybe uh, you can share my slides with, uh, with the attendees, right? So one of the slides has a couple of links to the largest uh, grant makers, making organization in Europe and the US, Journalist Fund and Pulitzer Center, and the link to a website which has a newsletter which packs together every week all grant opportunities, fellowship, everything. I find most of the information there. So uh, I make sure that my slides are shared so you have uh, direct, these direct links. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Stefano, for your time and for your advice here for all the freelance community. Well, good luck to everyone. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Anna, for inviting me to the conference. Stay in touch. Thank Bye. you, Stefano. Thank you. Thank Bye. you very much. And uh, yeah, people are asking if we're going to share the slides. Of course, we're going to share the presentations uh, that our speakers use during the whole event. In the in slides, you're going to find also the contact of Stefano. He has a lot of experience because uh, during the last uh, years, he has been working uh, using the funding of grants and also creating cross-border teams. So, of course, we invite you to contact him. And now, uh, we were talking about this exactly. I would like to invite you to check the grants and uh, the grants opportunities offered by the Investigative Journalists for Europe, the European Journalist Center, the International Press Institute, and the European Center for Press and Media Freedom. A total of 1.1 million will be available as direct grants for cross-border investigative projects. 
Yes, and um, as you can see, there are two types of uh, grants that might be interesting for uh, freelance journalists. One is the um, freelancer support scheme and one is the investigation support scheme. Um, just a reminder, the deadline for application is the 14th of July and there will be an Ask Me Anything session with the project managers next week on the 18th. But you can find all the information on the website that I think um, Angela has already shared in the chat. Thank you for that information. And now it's time for the panel of the day. What's new? The latest storytelling trends in freelance journalism. So it's time to get inspired. In this panel moderated by the multimedia journalist Aisha Salauden, freelance will discuss the advantages, the challenges, and also the benefits of working on freelance, uh, sorry, on creative storytelling formats collaboration, community engagement, and innovation will be at the center of this conversation. So please welcome Aisha and our panelists, Fariba Nava from the project On Spect Podcast, Nidesh MK from the Happy Ano Project, Alberto Teta from the Cyborg Queer Project, and Lawrence Ivil from the graphic novel Motherhood in Crisis. Welcome all, and the floor is yours. Oh. Hi everyone. Um, so yeah, this panel is about the latest story um, telling trends in freelance journalism. So we have a fantastic, um, fantastic panelists here. We're going to be talking about the new digital ways that um, you know freelancers are employing to tell amazing stories. We've got Fariba, Alberto, Lawrence. Oh, it looks like there's someone that isn't here, or is that just my screen? Um, yeah, someone isn't here. Well, I mean, while we wait, um, we're going to start with the presentations, and that's where you all tell us about the amazing projects you're working on. Um, I'm not sure who wants to go first. I can see Fariba first on my screen. So, uh, Fariba, would you like to go first with your presentation? Tell us about the Unspec podcast. Sure. Um, okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Fariba Nawa. I am a freelance journalist and have been for 22 years. And we started a podcast. It's a news and storytelling podcast called On Spec, Up Close from Far Away, stories that bring you closer to the world. We're still working on our tagline, so we're not crazy about this. If you have ideas, we'd love to hear from you. This is what we do a lot of times. We do audience engagement. So um, what are we? Well, how did we start? Let me see. The focus statement here is not coming up. Okay. That's a bit slow, so stay with me here. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, Hello. we can. Okay, but okay. So OnSpec provides risky deep dives in international news through storytelling from places like Brazil to Hong Kong to Malawi. We have reporters on the ground that will take you on these deep dives. They, the, the whole point of OnSpec is to have the reporter as a character in the story, um, and they have to have an emotional connection. We work with local reporters a lot of times. We train them. Um, and so what makes us different from other news podcasts is that our perspective is different. Each uh, season has a theme. Uh, we don't do parachute journalism, or we try not to. Our core staff does a lot of editing. Um, and if they're from that area, then like I'm in Istanbul, but I'm not Turkish, but I still have been here for six years. So I can do a story from here that I'm personally connected to. But you can't just parachute in. Um, we're trying to get away from the whole white gays, um, male, white correspondent who is the expert on, on the rest of the world. That's not our thing. And so who wants to listen to these stories? It's beyond people who are interested beyond their borders. And, and Europe has been a big um, target for us as an audience, specifically English speaking audience. This is our, uh, our new season has done really well. Uh, in fact, our listenership went up uh, three times as much. And uh, this was the topic you can see here. And it's a, it was, we came up with it um, and it's very timely, but also what we weren't hearing is stories about, you know, what we were hearing is always Western related, you know, and we wanted to go beyond that. We wanted to talk about how ordinary people are being impacted on it, by it. So the way that we did this season and it resonated is, it's, I call it our most innovative and ambitious season, is we brought together people on two sides of the information divide. We profiled them and then we brought them together to talk to each other. And the climax of each episode was, are they going to get along? Are they going to find common ground? Or are they going to go their separate ways? 
Um, so we had sort of like the so-called truth teller versus the, um, the disinformed talking to each other. And it was very hard because we wanted to not give a platform to more disinformation. So there, there were in each episode, you'll see us debunking what one of the sides is saying, but it worked out really well. We just aired our last episode from the DRC. So uh, I think that's the last slide, right? Um, and and so that's that's what we that's what OnSpec is. And we started with eight people. We're uh, seven people. We have an intern. And it's been exciting. We're going on to our fourth season, um, and I'm hoping that it'll be it'll we'll carry through. You know, we'll keep going. It's a freelance based, freelance run, freelance everything, um, and it's really great. It's all about teamwork and collaboration. We do a lot of collaborations with other podcasts. That's I think that's been the if we've been successful. That's how I see it. It's been a two year project and the secret to our success is collaborating with other podcasts throughout the world. So. Yeah, no, that's wonderful for Eva. And I think it's interesting to know that you're also employing different storytelling formats within the podcast, like getting people who are informed or and who are not as informed to talk to each other and also just training local journalists so that they can tell stories um, in the way that you want to. So I think that's fantastic. Let's hear from Alberto because um, I can see you next to my screen. Um, tell us about the Cyber Queer pro um, Project and what that, what that is about. In 2020, I've been working full time as producer in a television, uh, television channel. And then I left my job at the beginning of the pandemic. And thanks to COVID, I had the time to uh rethink about what i really want to do uh, and the question was what my community really need from me as a queer journalist so i began I, I began thinking how to tell lgbti plus stories in a different way uh far from the standard victimizing and stereotypical lgbti representation of the mainstream media so thinking about my next project i have asked uh, my activist friends in Istanbul about what they need. Uh, and I think this is a, a simple and golden rule for par participative projects and projects in general, because normally, like when you work in a, a mainstream channel as producer, you always look at uh, video agencies, at uh, uh, other newspapers, other medias. But the most important thing is going there and ask what uh, communities and uh, the people you, you are speaking about are interested in, like how, which, which is the image they want to give about themselves and what is the, which are their priorities. So after different meetings, we decided together to resume, let's say, vital community initiatives suspended because of COVID pandemic. Uh, so first of all, we decided to look for answer to the to like an important problem in this in this moment, so the, uh, the which is the growing violence experienced by LGBTI plus uh, people during the pandemic, both in their homes and in the street, and uh, also we decide to begin a, a discussion about what the safe space mean for LGBTI uh, plus people, and how to practically train the workers of LGBTI friendly venues in Istanbul. So they take, uh, let's say, an active role in making the space they work, uh, they work in safe and free. And uh, we did that with uh, a podcast series with uh, uh, practical tips uh, from the activists to the, um, uh, to the, to the workers of, this, of these venues. Uh, then, like we, um, we organized two forums, two video forums about one about like self defense and violence with uh, um, people of the, the community which experience violence, or uh, and they discuss about what is self defense for them, not just on a practical level, but also on a psychological and theoretical level. And also, uh, we we organized a video forum, um, a shooting with. Uh, workers, uh, owners, and uh, clients, let's say, of uh, LGBT 
friendly places to understand what uh, what the question was what uh, makes a safer place for you. Uh, so but I want to speak a bit about the methodology. So we organize the work uh, in an horizontal and anti hierarchical way. So we work in assemblies where, uh, as I said, we were collect collectively involved, involving both LGBTI plus professional, both activists and also uh, the people interviewed. So people interviewed, experts, shooting staff, have fully participated in this creative process. And this made the work flow, yeah, for sure longer, but uh, more intense, but also uh, very, very enriching and empowering. So the question I want to try to like briefly answer is why participative projects are useful. Yeah, they are taking time, but also they have advantages as I said. So um, I think like, um, Normally, as freelance, we, we think and we are uh, used to work by ourselves. And sometimes also um, uh, there is a competition between uh, ourselves, uh, between each other, between uh, freelance working on the same subject and in the same geographical area. So, but I think like, uh, on the contrary, it's more, it's very important to work collectively because uh, you have constant feedbacks from the people involved about your work. And also, it's um, uh, to create a participative proje project. It's more important. It's um, it makes more easy uh, to obtain funds because uh, how to say participative and collective projects are more sexy even for the mainstream because stereotypical clickbait stories are getting boring, boring um, even for for them. So, uh, but the most important thing I think when you go back to your communities, bar, assemblies, initiatives, uh, then you understand you empowered LGBTI plus people involved in the project because you give them responsibility and uh, and uh, the right to speak about how, about how they want to be represented. And that makes you feel proud. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it, this is a very important success. Uh, so then, just to like to end, I, I, I say that um, uh, the team uh, working at the pro this process in the in this uh, project uh, then create a collective which is called Cyber Queer, and now we are thinking about the next steps. So uh, and we want to work about LGBTI plus media activism, but uh, we don't want to uh, be the, uh, our self media activists, but the idea is to organize workshops for queers interested in media activism to allow them to become their own media. Uh, so that's our next step. Uh, I want just to end saying that we are in June, which is the most marvelous, sweetest, and empowering month of the year, I think. And uh, as it is the LGBTI plus Pride Month, so happy Pride to each, uh, each one of us. I was gonna say that because I can see the flag um, behind you as well, so it is kind of exciting. Um, so thank you for telling us about you know the cyber queer um, project. Let's go to oh god, please let me know if I'm saying your name wrong. Um, Nidhish, I'm so sorry. Yeah, um, it's fine. Oh yeah, please let me know how to say it right. Um, so just tell us about the um, Happy Anno project. Um, what it's about. Thanks everyone for inviting me. Um, I, I'll, I'm told I have like three minutes, so if, please let me know if I you know, reach that limit. Um, I'll introduce myself. I'm a journalist from India, from a small state called Kerala in the southern part of India. And um, I've been a journalist for a mainstream. I've been a journalist for eight, nine years now, and most of it was for the one of the biggest financial dailies in India called Mint. And I was assistant to that. Um, during the pandemic, I quit uh, one because I got a little bored of the you know the fatigue associated with working for a publication for some time, and then I also got a, a great book project to do, so I quit. But then in in March, uh, the Election Commission of India, which is the apex body for announcing elections in India, announced uh, a state election in southern India, which is uh, you know about it's an election in my home state, Kerala, and. Uh, you might know this state from Arundhati Roy's God of Small Things, the Booker Prize winning novel. So, uh, you know, I've covered like 
one one or two national elections and a couple of other state elections so when this election was announced you know that itch to get back to the field was there and i couldn't resist it so we thought what to do and this is my first time working as a freelance journalist independent journalist so we thought what to do and you know we we figured out this is a great opportunity for us to try and experiment new stuff which happens um, unlike in the west it happens so rarely in india to an extent uh, you know we are a funny country where some of our biggest politicians are invested in the media and some of our biggest media guys are invested in politics so it's a cozy bed that they share so uh, many times we we are not allowed to report something or we are you know barred from uh, searching for the truth and we have our limitations so we thought this is the first time hey we don't have an editor to you know uh, 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 bar us from doing something so we can do absolutely crazy stuff so we you know launched this project called happy ano happy ano in malayalam means are you happy ano means are you so uh, you know this this started as a way for us to explore um uh, you know in in many of these pre poll surveys they asked the question what's the mood of the nation so this was another way for us to ask that same question but in different you know uh, parameters so what we did is it's on the second slide um uh, we went on a road trip across the state and uh, there were like four of us uh three did the shoot and uh, uh, production uh, stuff the one person did all the edit so um on this on this trip we realized you know there are so many stories out there that are not covered in the mainstream news business and this was also a road trip so it was very fun for us to you know do this thing and uh, we converted the entire thing uh, custom made for social media you know what happens in india is there is there is an audience like you have in the west there is an audience here who has watched uh, who has grown up you know watching mtv and has now watched house of cards who is addicted to netflix uh, who know the you know the big brands like vice vox and all that uh, they subscribe to nanvaiti sometimes and uh, so they know the production quality of stuff that happens in the west but there are hardly any media guys here who do things for social media who you know uh, sometimes you know social media um, uh, news here is sometimes like an afterthought um, uh, you do something uh, uh, for tv or for the print and then as an afterthought you you node your head to social media instagram twitter and all and you create something there so um, we didn't want to do that we wanted uh, our entire road trip to be uh, tele visualized uh, in a custom made for social media thing so we we created an instagram handle um we we and we we um, uh, out of the four uh, two came from the print background print journalism background one came from you know a little bit of tv digital production background so uh, we know what quality we have to like aspire to so we we were very clear on the, you know we didn't compromise on quality uh, even if we are doing a one minute story we packaged it so well that you know so it's it's palatable to an instagram audience and you know it were um, uh, many people told us you know there were stories uh, uh, that they these are stories that they actually wanted to see uh, on 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 the news site so you know it was a big thing for us um, uh, after the trip uh, towards the end of the trip um, i think we had like three big takeaways uh, one was uh, we realized you know this whole convention of editors dictating news in most of the time india's national media sends their big guys you know um, uh, to the ground during election season because election season apparently you know um, aggravates all those you know inequalities in the in the society so uh, they send the it's uh, it's like a parachute journalism the big guys will come in they'll stay for a two day and they'll you know uh, uh, go back to delhi the capital and produce something that they think is worth the news uh, here we had an opportunity to serve the audience in a way that they seem you know when we asked the question happy ano or are you happy they interpreted it in different ways they interpreted it as a question about their bank balance or as you know about their health situation given you know covid has changed everyone uh, they interpreted it as, as a way as a question about their present government they interpreted it in ways that we never expected them to you know uh, talk about we got women talking to us about sanitary pads we got women talking to us about you know moving to a city life but you know uh, uh, shackled by uh, a village mentality on certain things like morality and all 
uh, we got men talking to us about talking to us about petrol prices this is stuff that we never really you know thought you know would be like you know too important for the public but that happened we 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 could publish sort of a lot of stories which went under the radar which later got picked up by organizations like reuters and we we kind of broke even by having an established media outlets coming to us and using our content for their distribution so that in that way our content got distributed uh, in a wide area and um, uh, and we got some money out of that also but, but that means i guess you know whatever stone you can throw at the big media misters they like um, the sole of the shoe uh ground reporting stuff and uh, uh since they were not doing it there since they are doing more into this facebook desktop journalism uh they came to us when we started doing this ground reporting they came to us and uh, asked us if we could share our content we were happy to do it uh that's all i'll happy to answer any questions okay i was literally about to interrupt you and say time's up um we'll get to the questions thank you for um telling us about the Happy Annual Project. I think it's a very interesting approach and obviously creates results. So I love that. Um, let's go to Lawrence, who's going to talk to us about, um, I think you co-authored it yet, the graphic novel, Motherhood in Crisis. So yeah, tell us about that. Hi, everyone. Um, just to start off with saying, yeah, I'm super happy to be here. It's a real pleasure to be invited to talk with everyone. Um, so yeah, I'll try and keep this quick. Um, you know, what is motherhood in crisis? Um, a bit of context, in, in Sierra Leone, one in 10 women die uh, during childbirth um, over the course of their lifetimes. Healthcare systems are fragile and have been further strained by concurrent crises, Ebola and now COVID-19, and access to basic maternal health treatment is often limited. Globally, maternal health stories to this day are, are often underreported and in this graphic novel, uh, four women from Sierra Leone, Memanatu, Hila, Kadiatu, and Tete, share their journeys of hardship and trauma and, and survival in a country where falling pregnant, pregnant uh, effectively means risking death. Um, the, the novel is a mobile first graphic novel published by Al Jazeera in October 2020, and it was funded by um, uh, fan favorites, the European Journalism Center, through their uh, health reporting grant for, for Germany. Um, just to speak again about sort of what's unique about this particular novel. So it employs a, a first person narrative approach uh, based on transcripts from multiple interviews conducted by myself and my team, who I'll talk about in a second. Um, so it very much centers the, the words and the lived experiences of, of these women. And the stories also include photography where appropriate and, and videos with experts um, talking uh, about the context and the background around these in individual stories. Um, on to the next slide. Um, so why comics? You know, well, the graphic for novel format fits this subject very well for a number of reasons. And I just wanted to mention really that, you know, the, these women uh, who told their stories to us, they, um, you know, display great strength, but they're also sharing their most vulnerable moments. Um, and all of them have experienced different uh, forms of trauma. And, you know, a graphic novel can be a less in intrusive way to, to visualize stories um, that are otherwise hard to document sensitively. You can visualize historical moments and, and center the, the experiences of, um, of those involved, in this case, uh, the, the women and, and girls. And, you know, comics have been proven to build empathy and understanding. Um, and I think that's a really important point here, um, trying to, to make these stories um, comprehensible to, to wider audiences. And, and the key point I've written there as well is, you know, that you can find value through ethical co-creation and participatory storytelling. When I talk briefly about the team, I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit more depth. Um, this is a mobile format and, you know, typically graphic novels are formatted for desktop, but the majority of readers across West Africa, they use mobile and we wanted to reach those audiences. And you can see here, that's the team involved. So uh, myself, uh, Alicia Praga, my uh, partner in crime from, from Austria, and, and Saidu Bar, a fantastic journalist in Sierra Leone who we work with on the stories. We, as a, a freelance group, we felt that it would be better to work with a slightly more established um, illustration studio um, to, to, to yeah, and ensure that it was a kind of collaborative effort, particularly during the pandemic as well. And so uh, we worked with Comic Republic and their principal artist, Samuel um, Iwunze and Yukaria, the, the colorist. Um, and, you know, projects like this, um, they're, they're complicated, they're, they're, they're intense, even more so during the 
uh, the pandemic and you know you have to work so closely with local partners and you can see the list of um, the key players there advocate which is a prison charity um, the Aberdeen's Women's Centre who um, work with uh, women who um, have experienced obsessive fistula um, which is uh, the centre of one of the stories um, and uh, some other initiatives there and of course you know the we worked with uh, Al Jazeera with Mohammed and, and Samaya can't um, recommend them highly enough. And, you know, there are so many things you can talk about when it comes to, to graphic novels and, and how to make them work and how to make them as participatory and collaborative as possible. And yeah, I don't think I have enough time to, to go into that. So um, all I will say is, yeah, please reach out if you have any other questions. Um, and yeah, we're, we're also looking to uh, present some Creo versions um, of, the, of the novels as well, um, because uh, yeah, they're essentially in English. So uh, thanks very much for listening. Yeah, oh my God, that's such fantastic work. You guys are all doing like amazing. And that brings me to my first question. Um, we've talked about comics, um, podcasts, social media um, for the Cyberqueer Project. It's pretty much everything, YouTube, you're everywhere. So these, this just lets me know that we have different newer trends in storytelling, um, especially as freelancers. I'm just going to start with um, Fariba. Can you very quickly tell me what you think is driving this new trend in, in storytelling? There's, you know, a lack of trust in mainstream media, a hunger for innovation, a need for stories about communities that are not seeing themselves in the news and... Um, you know, and I think there's a need to hear more about solutions rather than just bad news. Uh, that's, I think, what's driving this. Okay. Um, Alberto, do you have an answer as well? Okay, yeah, I agree. Uh, I agree uh, with Fariba. Uh, actually, I think there is a general need of a more democratic and story-based journalism. So the starting point is that uh, TV it's, is a one-way passive media where you can't choose what you watch. Uh, at most, you, uh, at the most you can do is change channel. Uh, but on the contrary, podcast, visual, comics make it possible to imagine imagine yourself a part of the story. I think this is very important. And then, uh, in, um, as a viewer, to imagine a part of the story. Um, mm, Make you, makes you living a, a deeper experience. So actually, uh, for me, like in five or six years ago, we were all speaking about uh, uh, immersive journalism, uh, transmedia, transmedia projects, free D videos. Uh, but actually, for me, this idea of augmented, augmented reality uh, wasn't successful as we thought. Uh, on the contrary, things. Uh, I think uh, th things develop in, in a much more more different way, and actually, what we need it's a, re a reduced reality, which uh, gives more space to viewer imagination and brings more involvement. Okay, no, that's fantastic. Makes a lot of sense. Um, what about you, Nidhij? Any any additions? Why do you, what do you think is driving this storytelling trends? I hate to put things in a listicle, but you know, on top of my head, two things. One, um, there is a genuine shift in the way people see journalists, uh, especially in third world countries and developing nations. You know, they, there is, it, India, for example, is a youth heavy population. They're looking for perspectives uh, more than analysis or just reporting. They need uh, like, you know, someone like a friend who can join them in a party or on the street and explain them to things. And second, I think they expect a lot more than the traditional uh, news presentation. They expect a lot more art than uh, there is. You know, it's not for nothing that some of the biggest uh, Indian news organizations have far lesser followers on Insta or Twitter than some of the, you know, very uh, niche creators here. You will see a YouTube influencer here. Uh, who is having a far greater following than any of the you know Indian news channels or Indian newspapers, and it's there for a reason. They, there is art in those you know uh, in those creations, whereas you know journalists are, or the news organizations are catching up to these digital trends. So in Happy Hour, for example, we tried our best to not compromise on quality, 
we used to use a weird dslr we used sony uh, uh, 7 and we alpha 7 and we used you know lapel mics con- connected to uh, a recorder and all that so that we don't compromise on quality and we expect uh, our readers or our audience i think expect that quality from us yeah that makes a lot of sense lawrence what about you well i mean i think from my perspective it's this push and pull right i think that there's this recognition now within newsrooms that they have to adapt you know that people won't uh accept some of the more traditional forms although there's absolutely a place for them and you know it's the hill on which uh, a lot of reporters and journalists um you know would die but i think that um from my perspective stories that are participatory that center the lived experiences of of people um who can share uh their experiences are at the center of the kind of best form of journalistic practice right now and i mean i think that you know all of these projects are a f- fantastic examples of that um i will add that as this is a freelance assembly that you know a lot of the onus is on the freelancer to to kind of bend and work incredibly hard to to redirect the ship you know and i think that has to be taken into account because you know i wouldn't want to suggest that uh, a graphic novel like this comes uh, without cost or or that it's easy to produce it takes a lot of time um and and the cost both personal and financial associated with with doing it to the standard um that you know you you need to um is uh, isn't small so i think that um, it's absolutely worth it um but um yeah it's uh, it's also a bit of hard work as well thank you so what i'm hearing is um people want to connect better with young people um it's also important to get your message across on social media what else did i write you're connecting with people trying out new platforms and the world is going more digital as well so it just makes sense to follow that um trend now specific question for uh, for you fariba I know um audio podcasts compared to say TV requires a lot more storytelling um because you can't really visualize what you're saying so I want to know how do you balance um telling super good stories like you do with also getting people engaged Well I think the podcast community is very organically a very natural uh, I mean a very collaborative community so uh, if you I noticed that people will who read don't necessarily listen and people who listen don't le- necessarily um read or watch videos everybody has their own consumption so what you want to do for what for what we've done with on spec is you have to have a niche audience and i think i'm not sure which one uh, i think alberto said this you really need to know what your community what your listeners want so we've done surveys uh of what you know we we did what we called empathy interviews uh of what our audience wanted from us and it's really important to engage through um that that's the the thing we've done a lot of engagement on social media empathy even on my own social media i'm always asking questions just like i did when i started my presentation i was like we're not crazy about our tagline help us come up with a new tagline make people feel like make your audience feel like they're part of making this podcast with you because it's actually for them thinking of it as a as a product actually um and it's also news right so having a point of view the, the the motto in the podcast industry is if you're making a podcast for everyone you're making a podcast for no one so have a very distinct pov or point of view that you're going to have as a target audience so what we, what we did is look at our analytics of who is listening from where and we decided to sort of uh, match it with what top down trends there were we wanted an audience from the global english speaking audience from the global south so we uh and then we looked at the trends there is a hunger in in the global south for podcasting uh there is a demand for slow news documentary style we started to target people who listen to documentaries for fun so people who want to be informed as well as entertained um and we we discovered that women are the most listeners in big cities So so that's how you you kind of um create your product as well as tell us the news of course we're still speaking truth to power that hasn't changed I think that that's where you have to meet the two um we be able to match it match your audience with your uh with what you're trying to produce and with the purpose you have so that that this has been a lesson and and it's been a training process we've learned 
Okay, you know, that makes a lot of sense to tailor um, your podcast to a particular audience or niche. You can't make a podcast for everyone. I never thought about it that way. So this is super um, insightful for me. Thank you for that. Um, Lawrence, you're, you're up next. Um, question. <laughs> I don't know why you're smiling. It's contagious. Anyway, um, so you're doing a fantastic job. I mean, you've done a fantastic job rather with um, the graphic novel. And I know like it's helping to protect these vulnerable women. It's also telling the story in a different way. It's fun, it's exciting, um, but I'm sure it comes with its challenges. One would be just not a lot of people, depending on the part of the world, like um, in Africa where you have covered you know, this, not a lot of people have access to the internet. So how do you combat the challenge of um, getting people to really view this visually? Some people don't even have smartphones. Like do, any tips for how you were able to counter this challenge? Well, it's a great question. I mean, I think first I would go back to one of uh, Fariba's answers, which is that, you know, you have to be defined in who your audience is and, and what you're doing. And I think that as a freelancer, you know, you, you have to be realistic about the resources that you have at your disposal as well. And I mean, our intention with this project from the beginning was um, to work with uh, local communities, you know, and to be participatory, to work with a West African artist. And we're already doing a lot of things there that are not necessarily normal in the practice of, of news development. And I think that that being said, you know, for us, we wanted it to be in collaboration with Conversations with Al Jazeera. We wanted it to be on mobile because, as I said in my presentation, mobile is the primary means through which people receive news online um, across sub-Saharan Africa. Now, the majority of graphic novels are presented in a non-mobile format, right? Um, and so this was already a slightly radical or different approach that was trying to cater to reach more audiences. Um, on top of that, I mean, speaking exclusively to graphic novels, of course, you can have voiceovers, you can have audio. When we worked uh, initially to um, uh, on, on the concept, we wanted to launch it with a Creo version and an English version because of the pandemic, because of the realities of the challenging production process, it just wasn't something that we were able to deliver at the end. And so a thing that we are doing is we're working with the partner organizations that we collaborated with on these stories um, to hand over the, uh, the comics to them in, in Creo that they can print, that they can share um, with uh, those who, who they're working with, you know? And I mean, that's, I mean, people would say, is there a balance of kind of like journalism activism there because there's, and there is a fine line, but I fundamentally believe in, in Alicia and, and the others who worked on this project is that, you know, when you put this much effort into creating something, you should just share it and get it out there and get it to as many people who, who can benefit and, and be influenced by it. Um, so that would be my answer to that, really. I think there are, there are tips um, and tricks, but the central answer I would have is don't do it alone. And um, yeah, just be honest about what you're capable of doing and, and collaborate wherever possible. Okay, it's fantastic and it's really good work. So I'm glad that it's been printed as well and um, you know, also being distributed because I feel like it's, it's just really great work. Um, so next to, I'm going to Nidish. Um, you chose social media, particularly Instagram for this um, project. I'm sure, um, and you've given us a bunch of reasons, but I really want to know, you chose it right, it's going great, but tell me about the impact that social media has had on the Happy Annual Project um, in terms of both the benefits and challenges. How has it impacted your work? It's like a two-way street, I guess, you know, one, um, on the un one hand, we were getting impacted a lot, or, or you know, I'm talking about um, uh, beyond, you know, general things that would happen if you create something for social media, something like, you know, um, immediacy and authority and stuff like that. But beyond that, there were like two major things. One, um, you know, we were getting instant uh, reactions from the people, uh, from the from our audience, and that, you know, in 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 may, on many occasions, it changed our reporting also. I'll give you one example where in a northern uh, district, we try to uh, interview some young guys. And uh, these are like very fashionable young guys who have worked in the Dubai gold market, com came back to Kerala with a lot of cash, and they have a like, you know, pushy lifestyle. Now, we interviewed them. They had a set of things to say about how their life is, how happy they are. By the time we were about to return from that district, we got a message from a 
uh, a psychiatry student, a woman, a girl from the same district telling us that if you get out of town uh, talking only about this man's world, uh, it'll be a mistake. It's a fool's paradise. There are women here who who live in like you know in a in a different world. Uh, you should interview us also. We rerouted our vehicle and you know went to her house. We interviewed her. So and she gave us a completely. I mean, it's almost like these two people are like in two different universes. She gives a completely different parallel universe. Second, I would say you know for the audience, the the first one first uh, first one for, for for was for us. The second for the audience, I think. No, nobody in India makes serious content for Instagram. The, it's taken for granted that uh, this Instagram is a youth-heavy platform. They don't pay attention to serious issues. But it's not. You just don't make content for them. You just don't make you know, uh, serious issues in a very authoritative way that you make for uh, you know, in the print journalism or in television journalism. You don't make that kind of a content in social media. We touched upon issues like communal harmony. We touched upon issues like minimum wage. We touched upon issues like women in a metro. And, you know, it's just that we just had to make it in a way that's true to good journalism. You have to be accurate. You have to be fair. You have to be like, you know, but you don't have to be neutral also. You can take sides. But you have to be fair. So we did that. And, you know, the youth simply followed us. Uh, so we, I think we broke that concept in here that youth don't take serious journalism very well. They're only driven to these platforms for the sake of entertainment, for the take of jokes uh, and all that. Um, that was another takeaway for us. And that's how I think you know social media is evolving here. Also. After our project, there were similar projects that were happening. And uh, we talked to them. And they were all interested in making the space uh, a little more worth for the time we spent there. OK, that's interesting, because I know that with social media, there are different ways to look at it. The impacts can be challenging or just super positive. So I wanted you to touch on both angles. Thank you for that answer. Um, so Alberto, with Cyber Queer Rights, I read about it and it's just a lot. So there's the training programs, there's the self-defense, there's um, you telling stories, there's YouTube. It feels like a lot and it feels like choosing these platforms was deliberate so i want to know why you could have gone traditional with tv or radio or something but there's just a bit of deliberateness you know i can sense it so why that i, I want to understand i guess what i'm asking is your thought process when um all of you the entire team you know was coming up with the ideas for cyber core yeah i think uh so why we we decide to develop this uh project digitally yeah, I think like, okay, there was, uh, uh, okay, for sure, because of uh, COVID pandemic, like, which made physical con contacts, contact events mu much more difficult. We didn't have much alternatives in the so, uh, In a way, and in a way, like, the, the global, this global pandemic became a possibility to transform the way we, we were working. Uh, so as I said, I was working in media, on, in, on television and stuff, uh, and we learned it by, uh, by like from the LGBT community, which reorganized uh, itself during COVID, like uh, mainly organizing uh, events, but even parties or uh, gatherings uh, or even protests. For example, the last uh, Istanbul Pride was organized online. It was an online Pride. It was very interesting, like to see how uh, you, you could like queerize the uh, cyber space in a way, uh, and uh, you uh, you can organize a Pride online. So, like looking at their uh, at their experience, like also we we decide to reshape our way of working. Um, also, uh, I, I think. Mm, so I can say that uh, since the physical contact we were missing, also we were missing uh, uh, like a space of discussion. Uh, yes, we have um, uh, Zoom meetings or I don't know, we can be my telephone or, or, or video chats, but we needed kind of like to reproduce the idea of a shared space where we, are, where we were chatting about issues uh, with, um, related with the community uh, in a in a natural way, so we kind of organized 
uh, this, uh, these forums, which were kind of a hybrid because the people invited were physically present in a, in a space, but uh, also it was like built in an interactive way. Also to kind of uh, mix, also the uh, cyber queer, it's a lot about this like mixed situation, like uh, physical and, and, uh, and cyborg and, uh, and virtual. So to mix like a physical presence and a, phys a physical discussion, discussion with uh, uh, a, a, a virtual environment. So I think uh, the answer of your question is more, uh, I don't know, we didn't have many other alternatives in doing so, but we kind of uh, take it as a possibility to reshape and organize our, our work in a new way. Okay, no, that's a really um, good answer you there was a pandemic so you really had to just make the best use of the resources that you had um within your disposal i was just super curious because everything was like well curated i'm like i need to ask him about his thought um process so the final question for for everyone i really was going to ask everyone like why what did i write what should we look so yeah i was i was gonna ask why we need to look into different storytelling formats but to be honest we've sort of answered that question in the course of this entire conversation. So if that's okay with you all, I want to change it to the things that we need to know as freelancers before choosing storytelling formats. We've established in this conversation that you have to, you know, figure out who you're telling the story um, to, your niche, things like that. So I think it, it would be, you know, interesting to get tips or advice on the things that we should really consider before choosing whatever format it is we want. So perhaps so for everybody, you can tell me about the things um, people should consider before starting podcasts. Um, does that sound good? Thank you. Ooh, you're muted. Okay, can you hear great. me now? Okay, yeah. so um, a storytelling podcast is a lot of work. What people don't understand is how much work goes into it. It's not like you just get a microphone, sit in front of it. Um, and I don't mean to degrade chat casts, podcasts that are, that are you know, a Q and A. That's also, it depends on the quality, but there are a lot of podcasts out there. If you want quality podcasts, it is extremely time consuming. Audio, I, I my background is in print and I've learned audio. Audio just has so many layers to it that you have to, take into account the time. We made a video about the process of making an on-spec episode, and it was one of the most popular videos because people had no idea. It takes months to put together one of our episodes. It's making, you know, it's an entire production of a half hour documentary, and you want it to be quality, so um, it's costly. So what we do is we, uh, we go to a lot of uh, friends and, and even family members to do voiceovers for us because we're doing international news. We're not just, you know, we're not just doing English. Um, and it's just been a lot of skills sharing. Those of us on the team speak a lot of different languages. So we'll step in and translate. We'll, uh, and then local partners, like um, I think you spoke about it, but the Sierra Leone project, we do depend on our local partners a lot. Uh, for this season, we hired out freelancers. For the previous seasons, it was in-house. It's easier when it's in-house. When you have a trained team, when you're working outside, your process has to be streamlined. You have to have templates for everything, explaining it to the outside world or the outside freelancers. This is how it works. There's an entire, like, you know, the, everyone I work with, even audio reporters who've done BBC uh, RFI stories, for three to five minutes, they don't understand the commitment to time that it takes to make a document audio documentary. And so they get frustrated and we've had to explain that, you know, and, and come up with like a very streamlined process and workflow. So that's one thing about podcasting. The other one is that to be as conversational and natural as possible. Um, it's not, you have to be different than public radio and you have to find that voice. Um, but again, who's your audience? The podcast you make, that's the number one lesson is who's your audience. And when you start to develop an audience, how do you give them what they need as well as produce the news and journalism that you want to? 
So that's a constant challenge for us. One of, I mean, one of the things I want to talk about that I didn't get to talk about is the challenge because we're global. It's very hard to find that audience because people will come in for that one episode that's about DRC or Hong Kong or India, and then they leave. So it has to be people. That's why we said it's for people who are interested beyond their borders. Um, yeah. So sort of a BBC audience who are who are yearning for indep an independent perspective. So again, we keep selling the independent perspective because that's what we are. But we keep pushing that out there. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. And like, because we don't have any more time, I'm going to need you guys to answer this same question for your project in literally 30 seconds, please. Um, so Lawrence, um, just, what are the things that people should know before um, you know, trying to tell stories through graphic novels? Just super quick. All I would say is just reach out to people that have done it before and um, because there's far too many things that I need to say. Um, but, um, you know, working with editors who ha are interested in the medium, it's still controversial in, and um, uh, or has less respect in, in some areas. So um, just getting those editors on board early, having the artist defined early, but also having flexibility to adapt to um, to the stories. But uh, yeah, if you've got any questions, just um, please reach out to me on Twitter or via email, and I'd be happy to answer any of those questions. Okay, thank you. Nidish, what about you? Since we don't have time, I'll uh, leave that answer in three words. Funding, funding, funding. <laughs> in a developing nation, in a, from coming from a developing nation and wanting to documentaries like you know HP or Vice or Netflix, you know the, to achieve that same level of quality, there's only actually one barrier: funding. Um, I don't think we guys are any short of ideas than those here in the West, or you know any short of technology or access than those here in the West. It's only the funding. And if you want to do good journalism, I think you really can't take the business away from it. It requires funding. I've covered entire South India for a national election, exactly half the amount of what I did for a Happy Anno project because my editor asked me to do do it travel only in public transport, spend as less money as possible, and by the time I got to my office after that, I still had my monthly salary there. But in Happy Anno, I spent double that amount. By the end of it, I had no salary in my bank balance. And you had to like prepare for the worst. I lost my entire footage for a day. My wife had a miscarriage in between. All those things happened, and you had to like got to prepare for all this, and you have to like you know take care of your balance. I don't want any of you guys to you know listen to this and uh, go proper off this. So please be careful about the funding element. Yeah. Super super important. Um, Alberto, do you think you can answer this in thirty seconds? Simple answer. I just uh, in every project you should you should first think about your uh, project aim and the target and the target the target group you want to reach and just then according to that uh, choose the format you will use. So because every target group can be reached in a different way and every audience and project has different ideal storytelling format. So really you should choose the best storytelling format to to reach your audience according to the project's uh, main aim, which uh, should uh, come at the beginning of uh, your project uh, design. So thank you. Thank you, all of you. <laughs> I know it was diff very difficult to talk about your projects in uh, so little time, but thank you for inspiring us with all the passion that you have for your different storytelling uh, formats and for your uh, story. So thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, uh, Aisha, for your moderation. And with this amazing session, we finish our freelance journalist empowerment conference. Really, thank you for being with us the last uh, three days. I know it was intense, but we had amazing sessions, but the most important is, is you, your participation. And uh, uh, just seeing you connecting, seeing you learning new strategies, new practices that can empower and connect in the community was just um, breathtaking. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> and Stella, are you there? <laughs> yeah, I'm here and I don't have much to add. Just yeah, stay tuned and keep your eyes open for any new things that are coming from the Freelance Journalism Assembly in the coming time. Um, yeah, we are very thankful that you were here. 
thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to everyone who contributed in the chat that made it much more lively and rich. And um, yeah, I feel very happy and I hope to see you next time. See you next time. Remember, you are amazing and an amazing community. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.